Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 102 of Through the Years, the podcast that reviews Ring of Honor show by show from the beginning. My name is Trevor Dame, joined as always by Matt Feuerstein, and we have a returning guest this episode. You would know him from the other big Ring of Honor podcast that started after us and did way more episodes, still put some out occasionally, even though they're busy boys. Uh, yeah, they put us to shame, like like so many people do, Matt. Uh, Jeff Schwartz. <laughs> An honorable mention. Great to have you back. We're back in Cleveland. You're back on the show. I, I, I'm i back on the show. I'm back from Cleveland, which I have now been in three straight days. Uh, I, and I'm thrilled to be here. It is quite the honor. Were you, you were there, doing super were you show there, prep. Were you there to see the football game? Uh, I was not, thank God. Um, I So – I grew up a Browns fan uh, within the last four or five years, maybe a little longer. Uh, I decided that I just had enough. Um, they're bad uh, every year, and they disappoint me. So I decided to invest my time in uh, my fantasy football team. And uh, I was always a Jags fan growing up. Uh, so... Uh, I am, uh, if I, my allegiances were in the Super Bowl, which they're both in the same conference, so it couldn't be, but if they're fighting for a Super Bowl and it's Jags and Browns, I'm going to root for the Jaguars. Uh, but no, I've been in Cleveland. I was at the Cavs game yesterday, uh, oh, where nice. they beat the Pacers. And, uh, the day before I was at the Apple store and then I had to go back to the Apple store again today. So, uh, I know I know a bit I know a bit more about the NBA than I do about the NFL. So I, I approve of your choice of of sport. <laughs> I like people well, we pretending have a, to fight. We we have a, a a duty to mention that all sports in Cleveland are centered around the Gray's Armory, where Weekend of Champions Night Two took place. That's right, the See, Haunted Armory, right? The, the, this That's is why uh, Jeff makes the uh, the big bucks because that is a perfect segue for today's show because uh, we are covering Weekend of Champions Night 2. It took place April 29, 2006 at the Cleveland Grays Armory in Cleveland, Ohio in front of a reported crowd of 450 fans. Uh, the Pro Wrestling Torch wrote, attendance was down for the Cleveland and Dayton events this past weekend, as both shows generated only 950 to 1,000 fans combined. Along with billing the two shows as a weekend of champions, Ring of Honor was heavily pushing the CZW versus Ring of Honor feud for both dates, but failed to generate the amount of fan interest that is usually present in Cleveland and Dayton, indicating that outside of Philly, the interest in the CZW Ring of Honor feud may be spotty. Now, I think Wade's overanalyzing that a bit. I don't think the interest in Cleveland and Dayton were down much, if at all, from the last time they ran that double shot, which I think was only the – this is only the second time they're running that double shot. I, I do agree that probably, obviously, like the CZW feud would be hottest in Philly because that's – CZW is a Philly-based promotion. But I do feel like, aha, you know, clearly this isn't working anywhere else. I mean – I don't necessarily agree with that. Well, well, it's also like, I mean, it would be a shame uh, if the uh, uh, interest was that far down because, I mean, especially this show was, you know, definitely of a higher quality than the other Cleveland shows so far. But like, they weren't really advertising these shows with like a lot of CZW related stuff. Like, there was obviously some major CZW happenings on the show, but. That wasn't the selling point of the lineups that were announced in advance. I don't know. I mean, obviously, Jeff would have the insight into this. Did you feel like CZW was cold in uh, in Ohio? It didn't sound like it from the crowd reactions. No, I, I, I very much don't think it was a CZW thing. Um, there were a couple outside factors. And uh, my little transition earlier, I, I think, fits right into this this point um because of the location of the gray's armory and the proximity that it has to both uh now progressive field and rocket mortgage field house which both had different names back in 2006 um when you have two games uh the Cavs played uh on this night in uh, 2006 as did the cleveland then indians so 
And you Porter even thanks base- like the crowd in the building during his promo at the start of the show, right? About yeah. like you could have gone to the baseball game. Yeah, uh, it, it's actually a funny story. I had uh, and the Cavs were at home as well, so I'm surprised Cornette didn't bring that up. Um, but he may not have known that both stadiums were right next to each other. Uh, you only see the baseball stadium coming in. Uh, the basketball arena is on complete opposite side. And there's a, well, there used to be a, a significant amount of space for like a free area to tailgate and pregame and that kind of thing. But um, in terms of uh, the crowd, I mean, this is LeBron's third year in Cleveland at this point. Uh, they're a playoff team. Um, the Guardian or the Indians uh, back then, the now Guardians, um, were just coming off a trip to the edge of the postseason. They lo- uh, lost on the last day. So, you know, attendance, uh, it wasn't so much that it was cold. Uh, the, the, the top angles, the CCW angle or whatever else was going on. Um because I, I had people come into town and stay at my house solely to see uh, the CZW story continue and uh, the title versus title match. Um, I, I don't want to mention any specific names because one person may or may not have been in the area of the Capitol on January 6th, 2021. Uh-oh. But, uh, yeah, I mean... There were people that came in from out of town to uh, follow this CZW invasion storyline. It, it was, it, it, I would say, it was probably the most um, the angle that got the most people to travel to the most places. Well, we know for uh, sure it was a draw in Philly that turned the entire city around for ROH. So, I I, I mm-hmm. did see it extend. I mean. Listen, Ohio is only one state over from Pennsylvania. It's not like a different universe. I mean, I know, you know, West versus well, Western PA versus Philly's, Eastern, but still, yeah. Right. Uh, you know, it's, it's not, yeah. it's, the point is, it's not like halfway across the country. It's not like it's, it's, no. yeah. It's a big six hour away from, drive. My big takeaway from Just Story was he is clearly friends with uh, Mr. Show alumni, Jay Johnston. So, uh. <laughs> Uh, that guy was that guy was uh, possibly a January sixth, allegedly a January. I guess we have to say allegedly, right? Oh, um, I, I I mean, this guy was uh, uh, not an alleged. He was on the front page of Yahoo News on a bus trip to the Capitol. Yes, uh, and, and we we'll and as we learned from the um, the episode we did for, on at our best, we should probably just leave it at that. <laughs> but, yes, I'm yeah. not mentioning any names. Yes, yes. So we we talked about the uh, last show. The card was a little bit different. This show, the card was a little bit different than what's originally announced too, but not majorly different. The original card, the initially mm-hmm. announced six matches, you had uh, the, the top three always stayed the same. You had Danielson versus Nigel McGuinness for the pure title versus world title. You had the tag title match, Aries and Strong versus Shelly and Rave. You had Danielson versus Seidel. Those didn't change. Uh, the six-man mayhem was originally supposed to have Delirious in it and uh, a graduate of the ROH wrestling school to be announced. Instead, we get uh, Flash Flanagan and Trick Davis fill those spots. And then this was supposed to be a, another, you know, early Ring of Honor show for Davey Richards, but obviously he got hurt before he could make his debut. He was supposed to take on the Canadian Cougar, one of his trainers, Tony Kazina. And then this is kind of interesting. The Irish Airborne's original match on the show was supposed to be a Steel and Adam Pierce, which feels like a, a pretty big styles hmm. clash at this point. But that was apparently, look at this uh, lineup I found, the original match for them but obviously i wonder if i wonder if the, the davy thing is what really caused all of the rearrangement because like, i can't think of another like impetus for why they would have to change a bunch of stuff i mean it wasn't like they were major injuries like i know you know obviously there were a few people missing from these ohio shows like obviously like besides richards like no rottweilers and no briscoes but you know i, I don't know why else they would have to change things other than because that one major act was hurt Yeah. Well, either way, we can talk about the card we did see. Uh, The DVD opens up with uh, Lacey and Jimmy Jacobs backstage. Lacey's yelling at Jimmy, as usual, telling him that tonight is his last chance. If he doesn't win his match tonight, she's never speaking to him again. Uh, Jimmy protests, pointing out, you know, it's a six-way match, so, you know, his odds of winning aren't that great. Lacey says she doesn't care. He has to win tonight. So, One of the the least 
confident promos you've ever seen. J- Jacobs was like, oh, I don't think I can win. <laughs> yeah, just um, continuing this little mini storyline for the weekend of if Jimmy doesn't win, you know, he's over with uh, Lacey. But next we go to uh, outside the building where Austin Aries and Roderick Strong are. Aries points out that the embassy has a long history with Generation Next and then mentions how tonight's particular match, though, Aries and Strong versus Raven Shelley, has never happened before. Not that particular combination of wrestlers, which I thought was an interesting little note for him to bring up. Um, Strong says they're going to prove that Generation Next is the best tag team in the whole world. So I I was actually curious uh, because Jeff would probably know this. Was that outside shot? Because a lot of times in Dayton, they have outdoor promos up behind, on a brick wall. Was that building Dayton or was that the Cleveland building that they were outside of um, doing that promo with the brick wall? I could not tell. Um, to be completely honest, I wasn't sure. I'm pretty sure it was Dayton. If I, I had to guess, uh, it would have been uh, if you pull up the hill to go to the front of the fairgrounds in Dayton to the fairgrounds Coliseum. Uh, it would have been to the left where that would have been filmed. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so opposite side of the, he- the hello pad, helio pad, whatever it's called. Uh, I don't, th- I think the, the bricking at the Gray's Armory is too dark for that to have been filmed in Cleveland. That was my hunch too, and just because it looks so familiar to me from the Dayton shows. It, and the lighting as well was what kind of, made me start thinking, I don't think this was taped today. Yeah, yeah. That, that, and that's what I thought. It, I mean, it, it certainly, you know, it's a semantics type point, but, um, you know, it, it is interesting to me that the last two Cleveland shows we've talked about, Jimmy Rave and Alex Shelley have had very important tag team matches on those shows. So I, I, we can get to it later, but one of the thoughts I had when, I realized that it was the tag title match main eventing uh, completely was thrown out of whack uh, yeah. based on, on, on how this went. Well, Gabe was uh, not always, but often pretty good about, he wouldn't just book show to show, but he'd book kind of like city to city. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, he, the things that would happen in one city would set up a match that would happen the next time they came back to that. So in fact, like tonight on, on the show we're covering, I believe when they do one of the Nigel Danielson rematches, not the most famous one, but they do it in Cleveland. So, you know, they could have done that in a lot of markets, probably drawn pretty well, but was the idea of Yeah, the very first gonna, the very first rematch actually. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're yep. not just gonna give you the first one, we're gonna use it as a setup to try and draw a, a you know, another crowd next time we come back here. So I, I feel like the the Aries and I mean the Shelley and Rave stuff, all that stuff is just kind of you know usual examples of Gabe kind of you know we'll we'll set them up in a big win in Cleveland and then the next show they'll get the tag title shot and then by the time we come back to Cleveland Alex Shelley won't be in the company anymore. But uh, um, yeah. we uh, cut to Bobby Cruz in the ring who uh, starts to go over tonight's card for the live event crowd. Uh, when B.J. Whitmer walks to the ring, he's back in a neck brace yet again. B.J. Whitmer's current gimmick, the guy who breaks his neck every night and still wrestles. Uh, B.J. Mm-hmm. says last night a group of pricks from CZW tried to cripple him, but they didn't get the job done. He didn't come here tonight to sit on his ass. He came for a fight. So he asks the CZW boys to get their asses out here right now. Instead, Adam Pierce and Jim Cornette make their way to the ring. They get a pretty big reaction from the crowd. And Cornette says the crowd made the, this is where Cornette says that the, the crowd made the right choice. Instead of going to the ballpark down the street, coming here to Ring of Honor tonight. Uh, Cornette points out how he, Pierce, and Whitmer are all hurt. You know, Cornette still has the legit knee injury that he's going to, after the show, get surgery on. Uh, Pierce has the, the legit staples in his head and Whitmer has the probably not legitimate neck injury. Um, Cornette tries to tell BJ it's not worth it for him to fight tonight. He points out that there's a Samoan back there ready to kick some ass tonight. He tells BJ he appreciates him, but he wants him to fight another day. He actually does a surprisingly good job of, like I was expecting in this segment for Whitmer to do the usual angry baby face thing of being like, you can't hold me back. Like, you know, I want to fight, you know, but instead Cornette actually like does a pretty good job of being like, look, we're going to have a lot more fights with CZW if you wrestle right now and get hurt and you're out forever, that's no good for everybody. And Whitmer basically like accepts it. He's like, okay. Uh, the crowd chants for BJ. Uh, 
Cornette says when the fans see the DVD of what happened to BJ in Philadelphia, they'll realize he's lucky to even be walking. And yeah, BJ just accepts Cornette's speech. He shakes his hand and he uh, walks to the back. It's so. funny that like they say like if you when you see the the DVD of what happened in Philadelphia because I feel like they actually played it up bigger in Dayton like the injury than they did in Philly. Like like they treated like that injury as more serious. Do, do you feel the same way? Yeah, I mean they they redid it, and I mean even if it was just the exact same, it's more it's it's a ma- more major thing by the fact that it happened less than twenty four hours earlier. Right. You know, like but but of course, like it's it's. I mean, we'll get more to it in the match. Other than the neck brace, <laughs> BJ does not sell that he has his bro- his neck broken now twice in a week. He doesn't uh, sell broken, it. <laughs> broken necks are like uh, brain trauma in modern wrestling. You, you it always heals itself somehow. But in a um, day, in a day, the, the one. <laughs> The one note I wanted to make about Cornette talking here, um, when he said the the show from Philadelphia, this the Hell Freezes Over show had just come out on DVD this weekend. So when when Hattie really? and I wow, did that this took a, show, that took a long time. Wow, I didn't realize. Episode ninety nine uh, of of an honorable mention uh, for those that would like to go back and listen. Uh, the DVD had just come out like the week before. And this was the first set of live shows that the DVD was available at. So people were, you know, in Dayton. Uh, they may have had a limited run, like at whatever the one before Dayton was, but this was like where they had the full batch. Um, and I think they just wanted to sell as much of it as possible. So Cornette mentioning when you see the show in Philly, the idea was to lead fans over to the merch table to, you know, ask to buy, the, hey, other, to buy the other Philly show. <laughs> yeah, because if they want yeah. the one where he gets hurt, it's the hundredth show, which probably won't come out yeah. for quite a while. Then at this point, for maybe another month and a half, yeah, because yeah. they rushed those milestone series DVDs. Those were all taped in like the span of maybe a week. Yeah, that's an uh, interesting point for uh, people that did not live through the era, which was we've talked before, including right now, about how some Ring of Honor – for a long time, Ring of Honor DVDs, you know, there was – it would ebb and flow, but there would often be a, a, a somewhat significant wait between when the show happened and when you could even get the DVD delivered to your home. And and, but, I, th- and I think this is pretty much the beginning of the era. I, can't, I don't know the exact show where it stopped, but where they stop offering the VHS tapes, which come out way quicker than the DVDs. So like um, – so that's so that's interesting too, where it's like the DVD is your only option, and it takes a couple months. But as uh, Jeff yep. just alluded to, uh, occasionally if it was a big show, Ring of Honor would kind of do kind of a rush job on that show. So although although you know, I don't remember shows ever being released like out of order during this era, I, I, no. I yeah. But there definitely would be sh- shows where they would crank ever. it up. Yeah, and or like Gabe, because Gabe would set up the production. When they would go do FIP and they would just put everything in the can as much as they could when they were doing the FIP shows. And if there was something they had to rush, it would just be Gabe going to Florida and like grabbing Dave and Lenny and saying, all right, let's go sit on this couch and commentate this show on the TV in front of you. So the the, the longest part was editing the shows together and not so much attaching commentary track. You know what I love. You know what I love to do is compare. Like, if if we ever like got confirmation of like which was the first show, like where commentary was recorded during a specific session, and which was the last, so you could compare and contrast the energy levels of the announcers uh, for each well, one. Because there's definitely a great variance in the energy levels of Dave and Lenny. Uh, when you listen to these shows and like you can guess, you know, which was near the end of a recording, which was near the beginning. Mm-hmm. But it'd be fun to know for sure. Yeah. And uh, yeah, Lenny Leonard has talked about, I believe, on the, the Between the Sheets podcast, his uh, appearance there. Yeah. he For those who don't know, he's talked about how like, you know, as Jeff said, they, they would just do it at uh, Sal, the guy from FIP who helped did production. They would do it at his house at night, recording commentary, watching it on a, on a TV. And they would like w- do two DVDs back to back basically all night. And they would – Lenny talked about it, I believe, on that show. You know, he was being proud of it. But like, you know, the, the – tr- the, you know, the challenge was to try and keep your energy up for not just calling sign that was taped, you know, days or weeks before, but – 
doing like six hours of that in a row, basically with mi- minimal breaks, having to know you have to like get this all out right now. You know, we don't have the budget to do a more um, laid back recording pace. We have to kind of get everything done quickly. Yeah, I, I imagine there was some probably some nights where they were really having to force it. But uh, when uh, Lenny joined, when Lenny joined Shane and I uh, to talk about it, he basically said it was like you couldn't get up and leave or like take a bathroom break because it would cause too much problems for the editing. Uh, that you just had to sit there no matter what and <laughs> get through the show, and then they just copy and pasted the audio on and off they went. Yeah. Like I, I, and and, you know, it's crazy. You would think, Oh, the, the, the tape record, I mean, we're off on a tangent here, but you would also think like the tape recording, you could pause, you could stop, you could kind of talk about what you want to do. And I think it might've been on your show. Actually, again, that's another great Lenny Leonard interview. If anyone wants to hear on honorable mention, that's a great episode, but um, it might've been on his show. I, I, your show, I forget, but, uh, I think Lenny said something like once, like even like if Gabe wanted them to say something, sometimes he would just have to like write a note and pass it to them. Like it's weird. It's tape commentary, but in some ways it has the same kind of issues of live where it's like you can't just pause it and stuff because it's just like, oh, we got to do this in a take. We got to get this done right now. So yeah, I'm because, sure write a note and tell you what you Because editing need. that would be such a huge – like they could do it. Like they could edit it out like you know, like pauses and stuff, but it would be such a huge pain in the ass that they probably just recorded it as though it was live more more of the time than not. Well, it's something that uh, Jeff, that you and uh, Shane have talked about on your show, right, where, you know, one of Shane's big uh, gripes was always, you know, there was a second handheld, handheld camera recording those shows, and yet Ring of Honor, gener- with very rare exceptions, only used one hand dedicated handheld camera and the hard cam, where the, you could have actually had a three-camera shoot, but they only used that as, like, a backup, yeah. and I presume, again, that just comes down to, I guess they figured it would be more editing if you had to, like, consider an entire third camera worth of angles for every shot where it's easier just to go, all right, is this a better shot from the hard cam or from this one handheld? But again, th- that would have made the shows better if you had an extra camera. Yeah. I mean, think about some of the angles or like you could throw to a replay from a different angle, uh, you know, on that, the big BJ Whitmer, super dragon bump. I mean, which, hey, they, which they did for- once in a blue moon, but it was rare. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's something just, really special they would go to that trouble for. Or, you know, throw it in a music video or, you know, the, like the highlight package before the main event uh, on this show. I mean, any any little thing that could have added to significant moments to take something that deserved an exclamation point and give it a second exclamation point. Man, like that it. it it's just one of those things like technology wasn't available or it just took too much effort. Yeah. Well, I wonder what that, like that Briscoe's versus FTR dog collar match would have been like, with just like the two camera shoot. Like, I mean, obviously it would have still been great, but like, you know, you definitely would have lost something. (laughs) Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, the the way that that was produced. um, and, And I think, I don't know if it was Mike Mansuri that was doing final battle, but I know he did the, you know, he's over at AEW now. Um, bravo. I mean, that was, it was just fantastic. Uh, it made it feel so big and so important. Um, and what a, what a beautiful tag team match. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess we should get back to, I got, we got, that, that was actually a great tangent, but, uh, yeah, so Cornette, this is a long promo, by the way, so Cornette still has quite a bit to say here, uh, Cornette says a year and a half ago, he woke up one day and he realized he hated professional wrestling, he'd been a fan since he was nine, been making a living at it for 30 years, and he woke up one day and realized he just hated it, he said, not because of the hardcore freak show, but because of the politics and the cartoon crap the people in Stanford are trying to force on him, he couldn't even work in OVW because WWE kept trying to foist their crap on him there. Cornette tells the comedy writers, the Stooges, the Yes Men in Stanford to kiss his big fat white ass. Uh, that gets a Jim Cornette chant from the fans. Cornette says Ring of Honor gave him a chance to do a lot of things he'd never done before, like work with his childhood idol Bobby Heenan, have a Midnight Express reunion with all, all three different members of the team for the first time in 15 years, getting to work with young talent. He gets treated well by you, the fans. He says Ring of Honor has revitalized his love of pro wrestling. 
And uh, Ring of Honor is at war not just with hardcore wrestlers, but with all these crummy promotions that will foist crummy shows on you and insult your religion, your nationality, and the fact that you're a wrestling fan. Now, this uh, this was the moment where I was uh, he kind of lost me because I'm like because like this was I thought yep. I thought this was a good promo, but like that does not sound like an ROH mission statement. Like this no. isn't like you know like old Americana. You know we're gonna you know we're gonna treat you like good American. Christian, you know, like, just like, that's not ROH. And the only thing I could think of was he was trying to take a shot at the whole Vince McMahon versus God storyline yeah. that had been going on in oh. WWE at the time. But like, it's still, it's just like, it, like, again, like, he always throws in something where the tone is just off. Like, I mean, like, not like nothing, you know, obviously, like, against people's nationality or religion, obviously, but like, wasn't ROH pretty much run by a bunch of like, you know, just like I am, like Jew from the Northeast, like not not people that <laughs> yeah. are not people that are like trying to like be the def- not like you know not that they're anti-American or anti-Christian or anything, but like their goal is not to be the defender of American uh, you know traditional culture or anything. So it was it was just a weird kind of incongruent line from Jim Cornette that you know is something that he is you know kind of known to do in these ROH promos from time to time is say things that are just. Bro- Totally inconsistent with what ROH is. The religion thing totally threw me off when I heard it because I, I, I kind of like I was watching it back and because um, it, it's I don't even know what the date was that we taped that show, but it's been a, a couple of years and I'm, I'm listening to him and uh, he said religion and I was like, wait, what? Yeah. What is that? Like, did did WWE book Kanye West or something? Like, <laughs> even did even I, even did the, I miss even that? The, even the nationality thing because it's like, I mean, I'm trying to think. Like, did ROH ever do like a rah rah patriotic thing at this point? At any point? No. I mean, yeah. I mean, maybe sort of the 911 thing, like that Glory by Honor in 2004, but like that's as close as I could think of. Yeah. Um. I, I just. I don't, I don't know. It was so confusing. I mean, I know Brian Danielson's the American Dragon and all, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I, um, yeah, I, this is, I, I, Matt, I will say to you, and I think this is something. This is a disclaimer we've used a lot lately, and I guess we'll have to keep using it. Which is, this promo really got over with a lot of the crowd, and I feel like a lot of these Cornet promos, we kind of go like we, we we complain about certain aspects of them, even though you know Cornet clearly in a lot of ways doing great work. But I also have to, I think we have to acknowledge that we're kind of the odd men out. Maybe it's just our perspective, all these years later, or maybe just as fans that watch every one of these and kind of where Cornet's head is at now. But like I have a similar complaint, which is I think one thing um, Ring of Honor really did well is they were an alternative to WWE, but they didn't come off as like constantly needling WWE. Like they would occasionally slip in a little jab, but for the most part, they kind of kept WWE's name out of their mouths. And, you know, sometimes that kind of swiping at the people above you that's in terms of popularity that that can be good, done well and fun and, and, and interesting. And, yeah, and Foley would bring up WWE from time to time, but usually it was like – not totally uncomplimentary, you know what I mean? Like he would, he would take very like mild like jabs at it, but then also be like, but you know, you know, we want WWE to be good, you know, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, it wasn't completely but shitting the back on it. compliment, King yeah. Mick Foley. Yes, but but uh, with this, this promo, I kind of felt like, you know, it, it gets in, it got into that thing where it was almost like it almost makes Ring of Honor seem second rate. It almost seems like Ring of Honor is like a side story in the Cornette story because you know for basically like two minutes, so he just goes on a rant about his old employer. You know, and, and when you started and, and, mentioning the politics in the back and stuff, it so like made me like just picture the Vince Russo bash at the beach yeah. promo. And I'm like, obviously, I, that would be the least you know that would be the worst comparison that you could ever say to Cornette, but it is what it is. But to my original no, point, you're 100 right. The crowd, you know, was chanting for Cornette and popping big when he yeah, said, but, you know, but, all but those writers. But, that's, stuff a, but just, that's a cheap pop, you know. Like it's it's it e- is, it's but, easy. It's not like it's so impressive that he got over by being like, oh, we're cooler than WWE. Like it's not like, oh, what a great promo. Like a- anybody could have done that. I'm just saying that there's while like, you and I are usually could, go, oh, go, go ahead. Trevor. I was going to say, well, say well, just, well uh, you, we can complain about. I just also want to point out. Even though, yeah, you're right, it is an easy pop. The fans in these buildings, when Cornette does this stuff at, in the time, were not turned off by it. The way maybe we're kind of like, eh, at a, you know, True. today watching it. Well, Jeff, we're, 16 you, you have- year, we're, 
we're 16 years removed from this. So when you've heard 16 years of we're here not to insult your religion, your race, your creed, your ori- sexual orientation, your nationality, your although, this, although your I that. Although I don't think 2006 Jim Cornette would have a problem with insulting a couple of those things, but yeah. <laughs> no, like it, it's just I, – I think it's you know being so far removed from this show and having heard – this same Jim Cornette spiel over and over and over and over again. Um, and then poking the, the Stanford bear, um, you know, the point here is, okay, we're at war with CZW and we got a guy with a neck brace on and a supposed broken freaking neck and uh, angry Samoan in the back. And we got a, a title versus title match for the first time in company history. We have all this stuff going on in a weekend of champions. And Jim Cornette wants to talk for two minutes about the people that fired him and, you know, took away his minor league territory. Yeah, th- that's a great I, I point. Just, because I was just going to say, like, I just mentioned that recap. There, there's a moment, I, I believe I said, where Cornette outright says, like, you know, we're not at war, you know, with just the hardcore guys. And then he just focuses on WWE. It's like in storyline, he should be way more pissed at CZW who, you know, has caused him all these headaches, like you were just saying, than like, oh, you know, these writers from WWE. Like in storyline, that, that comes off as just not where his focus should be. But clearly, you know, he has a grudge and he likes at this point in his career, you know, sticking it to WWE. And some of that's probably valid, but not – Maybe the best place to just go on that spiel. And it's also painfully obvious to me. And and, I mean, as a a loyal, diehard, deep vein thromboso, uh, (laughs) like Jim Cornette knows nothing of what CZW is. Like he doesn't know what's what their current stories are. He knows nothing about the balance between the, the deathmatch wrestling and the actual real good wrestling or even how many guys that are already on the ROH roster came from CZW. Or also currently work CZW sometimes too, you know, like, you know, it's, yeah. it's the, very funny. The main event of this show, three of the four guys wrestled in CZW before they wrestled in <laughs> ROH. Yeah. yeah, so uh, moving on, this this court had promo, man, this is, didn't expect this segment to take so it long. Wasn't but, even uh, a ba- it wasn't even a bad promo, it's just like, he's, he's no. just like, his presence is so, it's so weird, because like, he's obviously a great yeah. promo, but also, like, a lot of the stuff he says is just wrong, <laughs> like, it's just funny. So at this point in the promo, Cornette says, Ring of Honor needs your support, your purchases. And I, I love this. He goes, and they need – Ring of Honor needs your posts on the internet. So I thought that was yes, kind of cool. that caught me. <laughs> I, I love got- uh, this, the surrealness of Jim Cornette of all people being like, Ring of Honor needs you to post on the message for its kids. Like it was like, wow, that's weird. Didn't expect him to say that today. But um, uh, I could hear Shane Agadorn's eyes roll <laughs> when that line came out. Um, and so Cornette then does some kind of house cleaning. He mentions how he needs surgery on his knee. He'll be gone for a couple of months, but he will not relinquish his role as commissioner, but he needs someone to watch over ring of honor while he's gone. So after he puts over Adam Pierce, he names him as his temporary Lieutenant commish, uh, Pierce acts surprised. Like he didn't know that Cornette was going to do this, but he shakes Cornette's hand. Jim says he'll be on the phone with Adam at the future shows, and Adam's word at those shows will be Jim's word. Uh, Pierce points out when he first got to Ring of Honor, he didn't get along with Cornette. He hadn't paid his dues yet. And when he got his head split open at a recent show and he saw himself bleeding, he realized that was Ring of Honor red on the mat. Uh, Pierce thanks all the fans and Cornette and says he loves Ring of Honor. Cornette starts an Adam Pierce chant. Cornette then ends by addressing Claudio Casanova, and he says he has a little poem for him, which I believe are line, lyrics from the song What Becomes of the Brokenhearted. And he then adds his own line at the end, which is, I'm saving this crutch to shove up your ass. He also, I think, he also um, quotes, reach out and I'll be there by the four tops, I think. He's like, life's filled <laughs> yep. with such confusion and happiness is just an illusion. All right, I'm going to stop singing now. But I'm pretty <laughs> sure those are the lines that he sings, and I'm pretty sure that's from the song that it's from, so. So uh, they leave to another big Jim Cornette chant when Nate Webb comes out and uh, he takes out Adam Pierce and then Ace Steel comes out. He chases uh, Nate Webb through the crowd. 
the Ring of Honor students check on Pierce, who now has a towel over his head. They're selling that the staples have been reopened. So this was like a 12 minute promo segment. I thought it was kind of long. You could have cut out the WWE stuff in the middle, but it, I, I do. I, I also guess I see that. When you bring Cornette to these shows, like, what else is he going to do? Like, you want to get your money's worth, so you have Cornette go out there and talk. And he did do some housekeeping. And I did appreciate even that, you know, Pierce and Cornette, they, Pierce especially, went out of his way to be like, you know, the, you know, to acknowledge that, you know, we had been feuding before. And now he's, like, giving me this really nice job. Like, they were really trying to sell that, oh, Pierce kind of realized he was a shit in the past and he's changed and, you know, kind of tries to get on the Ring of Honor fan side. So I, I appreciate that kind of stuff. Um, and that brings Adam's us to a, uh, Adam's a good baby face, and I don't think people realize it because he's authentic as a character. Yeah, and he didn't and get. I was going to say he didn't get many chants probably for him in Ring of Honor history, like the where Cornet gets the crowd chanting from. You know, he probably isn't getting partly because he's playing a heel so often, but there probably isn't that many times in his Ring of Honor career that Adam Pierce gets like a name chant, and this is a night yeah. that happens. Um. Opening match is Colt Cabana and Conrad Kennedy the third defeating Irish Airborne of Dave Christ and Jake Christ at 8:47 when Cabana pins Dave Christ after he hits a power bomb. Uh, Matt, this would be a uh, Conrad Kennedy the third's main card debut for Ring of Honor. He obviously doesn't do much in Ring of Honor, but uh, he had previously been on a dark match on the Dissension show. But uh, yeah, this is continuing the storyline of Colt Cabana is uh, in the openers and he's relearning, you know, his technical wrestling. What do you think about it? I um, so the early part of this match I actually enjoyed a lot. I, I thought that uh, Irish Airborne with their you know springboards and stuff looked pretty good. I um, I thought that uh, CK3 was kind of an interesting presence. Um, like there was there was one point where um. Um, like he's, he's whole, like, so Colt does some headlocks early and then at one point, uh, CK3 is holding a headlock and he goes, Colt, I can do a headlock too, see? And Colt responds with something that I couldn't really understand. And then CK3 yells, shut up, Colt. So I guess they were an odd couple team. Um, but then like a minute later, um, Dave Prezak says that CK3 is a quote, no nonsense wrestler, but. I'm pretty sure that the first thing that he did was some nonsense with the back and forth with Colt. There was also another moment where Colt was yelling, hook the leg, retard, hook the leg, which are they, were they feuding on the indies or something? Cause that's the way they made it seem here. It was like, they like, they had this weird, um, odd couple banter. I don't know. Um, but I was enjoying the match, um, until near the end, they're doing a little bit of a dive sequence and Dave Chris obviously fucks up a springboard. Like he, and like he like he slips, so he just kinda like falls and kinda turns it into an elbow. And sort of he lands okay, so it wasn't as obvious as it could have been. And in fact, we even get an Irish airborne chant after it, so it was a pretty good recovery. But it felt like after that there was just like some timing issues, like they were just kind of disoriented and maybe Irish Airborne lost their confidence a little bit. Um so just the, the final sequence was just I don't know. It just didn't feel right to me. So that took the match down a bit. Um, so I would say I enjoyed about three quarters of it a lot. And then the last like third of it or less quarter, I should say, took it down a bit. So I it felt like with all the miscommunication between the Chris and CK3, maybe they weren't quite ready for prime time here. And the match ended up being, I would say, OK overall. Uh, Jeff, what do you think? Especially because uh, you know, Irish Airborne were Ohio products. I noticed on the previous show in Dayton, they got a pretty big reaction on that show, and you know, so you would think this is a big early weekend for them. They're getting wins here, you know. They're looking, um, you know, they're getting in the front of like a home state audience, and they're getting an opener here. What you what you think about the match? So the idea of the match kind of bothered me. Um, if Colt's supposed to like work his way out of being a hardcore wrestler and back into a scholarly technical wrestler. Um, why is he in a tag match? Uh, <laughs> so that was my first thought. My second thought was uh, the Irish Airborne are not necessarily the appropriate tag team to be working on your technical mat wrestling <laughs> European yeah. style with. 
Uh, and then I guess with regards to Conrad Kennedy, the third, he he's from a, a part of Ohio uh, that borders on Michigan. It's just outside of Toledo. Um, he had a pretty big name uh, through at the time it was uh, sport or it was Fox Sports uh, Ohio. They had a local wrestling program on Sundays um, that was actually running a show the next day with Samoa Joe against Claudio. Wow. Uh, so they had the same match back to back days. But CK3 would wrestle there, um, and he was a pretty frequent presence with like Johnny Gargano and Matthew Justice on their TV show. Uh, so people recognized him and knew who he was. Uh, and he was okay, but you know, like, uh, kind of reminded me a little bit of, uh, Simon Diamond, um, good personality, a lot of like outward smarmy charisma, but this was not the place for him to show that off. Yeah. And I think he started getting ROH opportunities around this time he did at dark, the last show, I think, or maybe even. Yeah. Dissension. The, I think the last Cleveland show. Yeah. He get, he got a dark match. Yeah, uh, you know, so he had been around, but um, in 2008, he just was like, okay, the CK3 character is not getting me over, so I'm just going to repurpose myself as Crimson with a K. <laughs> and uh, he basically just dressed up as the Joker to wrestle matches <laughs> and talk like Heath Ledger. Uh, and he vanished very shortly thereafter. <laughs> uh, from the, the local scene. Um, well, it worked, it worked for Sting, but uh, I guess it can't work for everybody. But uh, when when did Sting start that? I'm not even sure. God, um, I mean, obviously Joker, after the movie. he was Joker Sting. I mean, it, was, it yeah. had to be after 2008 because that was when that movie came out. But I, I just I know there was already a Crimson that was in TNA Impact around that time. Um. He was like supposed to be Red's older brother or something. Hmm. I'm sure this is a story that's not ringing anyone's bells, but yeah, he was supposed to be like Red's older brother. Uh, he's in the NWA teams with uh, Jax Dane um, now. That Crimson, uh, but yeah, the the CK3 era kind of ended within about a year's time of this, and. Uh, I don't know if this is how Cabana gets his mojo back, but <laughs> um, it was a match. Uh, yeah, I just looked up, by the way. Uh, Joker Sting was 2011 in TNA, but... Um, Timely. <laughs> so, much like the uh, the opener of the night before, yeah, this is another Colt Cabana opener that I felt like... It kind of eases you into the show with some comedy, some real basic stuff. It kicks it into a higher gear for the final few minutes. You know, yeah, those first few minutes are basically mostly about everyone doing headlocks, Colt screaming on the ring apron that someone else is doing his finisher when they do a headlock, which is funny because that, that that wasn't I, I don't think that was ever his finisher. But um, Colt does a lot of comedy one liners from the apron, like Matt mentioned, the, uh, you know, hook the leg and all that stuff. Um, you could make, but yeah, you could make the same criticism about this match, like that we made on the show before, and that Jeff J basically just made, which is um, the announcers on are, are you know hyping the story that Colt is refocusing and sharpening sharpening up his technical wrestling skill, and in the ring Colt is me actually doing some of the most laid back goofball comedy wrestling he's done in Ring of Honor in a long time. So like this is we mentioned yes on the last show, this is the weekend he starts calling that butt butt in the corner the flying asshole. So yeah, the story of what they're telling us in like commentary clearly what like the gay book storyline is and how cults actually wrestling in the ring don't quite mesh up but um i thought the match was fine ck3 i seems like a perfectly acceptable throwback style wrestler although unfortunately for him i feel like adam pierce kind of already hits those notes for ring of honor better and ring yep. of honor is the, the kind of company that would only probably want one of those guys at the same time, probably like for those who haven't seen him in this match, CK three is the kind of guy who he doesn't just do a slingshot suplex. He shouts Tully Blanchard before he does it. So, you know, he's that kind of very honest sleeve throwback wrestler, but his selling's kind of expressive and over the top in like a fun old school heel way. You know, he's not afraid to like look goofy. Um, 
the Irish Airborne, meanwhile, they get a minute or two near the end to kind of go really wild with some spots. I agree, Matt, that that spot where they slipped off the top, you know, it looked ugly, but they kind of saved it. Um, I feel like the Irish Airborne, in a way, were kind of a throwback as Ring of Honor and indie wrestling were changing eras because we've talked about in the past, you know, like – the SAT, Red, Quiet Storm, Brian and Excel, all those guys, like they could do really cool high flying moves, but there was always, they weren't always the smoothest. They were the, the incredibly innovative and exciting, but some, a lot of those guys, you know, you'd be kind of watching like, Oh, I just hope they pull this off. And when they did pull off, pull it off, you'd be impressed by like what they did, but maybe not how smooth. And then we're in an era here where indie wrestling was kind of transitioning to the Matt Seidel's of the world who like, not just they do high flying moves, but God, they're so smooth and so fluid and they rarely ever screw it up. And I feel like Irish airborne was kind of a throwback where they did cool things, but you were always, you still had that old school kind of original 2002 ring of honor scramble feeling of you knew any one of these moves could screw up at any time. You knew that even if they did hit something, it would look kind of, sometimes look kind of ugly and so in a way that – yeah, they kind of feel they kind of feel like they were almost – they would have been a better fit, I feel like, in 2002 Ring of Honor. They would have killed it in 2002 Ring of Honor, I think. But um, And they never overall, really took that major step forward either to like go from being the flippy tag team to having like the ability to do those cool moves and have characters and personality. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's just uh, – yeah, they just didn't quite get there, but uh decent match, but nothing instantly forgettable, I'd say. But that brings us to the second match on the show. Delirious defeated Chris Saban via submission in 11 minutes, 59 seconds, when he made him tap out to the Cobra stretch. I thought this was a, kind of an interesting – occasionally you get this where some of the major newsletter guys, they, they're – kind of only middling knowledge of Ring of Honor because they weren't watching every show would kind of show up. And this was one of those examples because uh, Dave wrote in the Observer at the time, Delirious pinned Chris Sabin, who was obviously being phased out of Ring of Honor because of the phasing out of most TNA guys, except for the aforementioned ones, which he had mentioned it would be like uh, Daniels, Joe, guys like that. And I'll just note, I looked up just to be sure, Chris Sabin had wrestled a whopping one match in Ring of Honor in 2005, and this was his first match in 2006. So for Dave to be like, Chris Sabin's being phased out of Ring of Honor, apparently the phasing had been going on for a long time then because – It's a very had, slow process. Because apart from like 2003, Chris Sabin – a little span in 2003, Chris Sabin was never really even a semi-regular Ring of Honor. He was a guy that would – occasionally they would kind of bring him in as a treat when he was available or when it made sense for them. But this was always kind of his slot was to come in occasionally. Uh, Jeff, what'd you think about this though? Cause this is, this is, yeah, this is the la- first and last time Ray Vaughn fans would get to see Saban for the entire year. So I, I actually really thought this was a solid, like, I hate to use like the, the star analogy, but this is like just a good solid wrestling match, like three stars, rock solid everything made sense there were a lot of personality like i thought around this time that chris sabin was somebody that was very technically proficient but didn't quite have that outward charisma uh that he would later find and um maybe he's not the most charismatic uh guy but he at least would be able to show a little bit of uh the smarmy personality uh, that Alex Shelley has, he would, you know, rub off on Sabin, and that's why they they worked so well together uh, as the machine guns. But here, you had Delirious to carry the personality side of the match, and Chris Sabin to do the wrestling side of the match. And I thought the uh, spot where Delirious hits the panic attack, and then uh, a Hurricane Rana uh, out of the corner, he gets a two count. Um, and he's selling his arm. Uh, Saban comes right back uh, with the heel kick. Uh, it's like right in the middle of the match. Um, but I thought the crowd was like at their peak right when you needed them to be. They followed this match, um, you know, up at the start. And then they were, you know, peaking. And then they brought them down right to when Saban tapped at the finish. It, it, like 12 minutes or whatever it was. Um it, it to me felt like one of the better organized matches 
uh, in terms of guys that are not full time and guys that have not yet established their ceiling yet uh, in Ring of Honor, which was kind of a staple that they'd bring somebody in, try them out, see how they fit. Uh, or maybe they'd only use them when they went to the Midwest or to the East Coast and there'd be a full timer against them that was on the rise. It was like a proving ground before proving ground was a thing. Yeah, I would uh I would call it like to me if there was a canned product called like generic level two thousand six indie undercard match, this is what was inside. And that sounds like a put down. I really don't mean it that way. It's just when I was watching this match, I felt like the word that kept coming to my mind was reasonable. Like there's no story really going into this match. There's no story really within it other than delirious selling his legitimately still hurt hand a couple times. And then his win continuing the little push he's starting to get in ring of honor. But it's like the crowd's reasonably into the match. They have a reasonably like exciting final few minutes. The pace the whole way is pretty reasonably decent. Like it's an above average match. It it, it kind of like, it's not a match I will, remember but it's a very professional match like yeah like you really appreciate like oh these guys could probably have this match you know any night anywhere um i thought the highlights were probably saving taking a belly to back suplex pretty high and then he hits a, a Sami Zayn haluva kick to maybe the biggest reaction of the match and jeff like you hit right on like i literally in my notes wrote something to the effect of like this was a match where I really noticed, you know, what I, I'd always known, which is Saban is a guy who his execution of moves was really snappy and impressive. But at this point in his career, he was missing that extra intangible, that that charisma. And it's funny because I felt like watching this match, I was like, oh, you know what this guy needs is he'd be a great like workhorse in a tag team. He was paired with a guy with more, a little more charisma than him. And then you realize, oh, that's exactly what happens. And he has huge success yeah. from it because he's about to form, you know, the Motor City Machine Guns with Alex Shelley. So like you can kind of see exactly that he that he's ready for that role, I would say, when you watch this match. Well, and, and you mentioned the execution. That corner basement dropkick that he does is – I would say it's on the list of like signature moves in wrestling that get overlooked because it's not like a finisher and it's not some sort of flippy thing or like world champion move, you know, to win the title. But like it's in the middle of the match. And when he hits it, it just looks so beautiful. Like he's floating in the air and then bam. Yeah. It's stuff like that where just that like extra half second of hang time that someone gets. It's mm-hmm. again like the same way I see Matt Seidel on some things where there's just the difference of other guys could do that move, but just those guys, they just they hang in the air a little bit more or they hit a little more precisely. You know, th- th- those things can make a difference actually between you going like, oh, that's kind of neat to like, wow, that guy's just really, really smooth. But uh, Matt, what'd you think about it? Um, I really, really like this match a lot. Like, I don't think it was a great match, like per se, but I had a really good time watching it. I think, um, you know, I, th- I think so I, w- I would put it a level above what what you said, Trevor. Um, yeah. I think part of it is expectations, because you know, you know, I know you said that Saban, you know, was missing something, but if you watch his TNA stuff from like two thousand four, two thousand five into 2006, he was a lot better there than he was in ROH. I just think he fit the style better and he got over better there. His ROH stuff had never really impressed me. Um, re- I can't think of a single Chris Saban ROH match from before this where I was like, damn, like what a good match. Um, but this match, I guess because those expectations were lowered and Delirious, Delirious's match shit the bed so bad the night before that I really thought this was an excellent recovery for him and just like or just like a good fun match that the crowd was into and like you said the the ending sequence was I would say more than reasonably exciting I think it was quite exciting and the execution was great the crowd was rocking and it was just a really it just it just added a lot of momentum to delirious I thought this this match really um delivered what it needed to here you know they weren't trying to steal the show but they did Better than I thought they would have done in this role. Yeah. So I I, I would say better than the previous match for sure. And yeah. you know, in some ways, this could have been a good opener. You know, but yeah. So I, I would give this a, I would say a, a big thumbs up for what it was. 
Um, and then after the match, Delirious hugs a fan who has a sign that says, Delirious is my dad. And Delirious then proceeds to take the sign, hold it in his mouth. So give that fan a thrill. Um, that brings us to the six-man mayhem match. Jimmy Jacobs must win or else Lacey will stop talking to him. And luckily for him, Jimmy Jacobs does win. Uh, he defeats Flash Flanagan, Jay Theory, Jimmy Yank, Spud, and Trick Davis in eight minutes, two seconds, when he pins Davis after he hits a top rope contra code. Uh, I feel like I've gone through this spiel so much now uh, often, but like I always say this. When you're like us, you've seen five million scrambles and six man mayhems and all these Ring of Honor spot fests. They have a formula, they have a style. All you want for them is to be kind of mindlessly entertaining, not overstay their welcome, do something novel that st- stands out. I feel like this accomplished all three. The thing that stands out, not intentionally, unfortunately, for Jimmy Jacobs is he, uh, basically, as soon as the match starts, I believe he tries to just like jump in the air like you do for a leapfrog, and he tears the ass of his pants like right to the crotch. Yeah, no, so I know Luckily, this, is your, yes. this is your segment, but are we sure yeah, that on. was unintentional? Because like they did do spots with yes. him. Yes. Okay. 100% unintentional. Okay. So you, you would know, <laughs> Jeff. The, the thing that reminded me. He oh. brought it up on, on the interview that he did with us. Uh, Quote, I ripped my pants in Cleveland and I was never the same. Direct, that is a, a specific direct quote from his podcast. The, this, the, the thing that gave me flashbacks to was Matt, remember, or uh, both of you guys, you both, I forget, I forget they're a guest extensively as well, Ring of Honor. Um, 2002, remember like one of the early Spanky matches where he would get like his outfits from um, like thrift stores? Foreman like- Mill. Yeah, he 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 tore his I believe his pants on one of those shows. So not now, since now, then, now I one I remember that that like that clouded the entire match. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So um, in this match, you know, uh, you know, Jimmy tears the ass of his pa- pants. Luckily, he's wearing black trunks underneath. So, you know, safe for the kids. Uh, Jimmy Yang quickly makes the tear actually much worse. He like tears it almost completely through. Um, and it's th- but then after that, we get a scramble match. And uh, there's it's like a scramble match. There's some exciting spots. There's a, a couple awkward whiffs of miscommunication. Like there is a really awkward moment where. Flash Flanagan kicks Jay Fury, and Fury, you know, bends over. He's doubled over in pain. And Flash just awkwardly stands there, and Fury just holds it. I'm going, like, what's going on? And then you realize Flash Flanagan is waiting for Spud to climb to the top rope and do, a, like, a pre-planned move where, you know, Flash will catch him as he flies off the top. And so, like, Flash is just like a deer in the headlights having to wait because Spud's probably a little bit late for that spot. And I just felt like... Yep, this is a scr- this is a scramble. Um, we then get a big dive train where everyone does something big, and then we get the much rarer, stupidly ridiculous sequence, which I'm not necessarily a fan of, but it's so stupid sometimes it entertains me. Where every wrestler in the ring does a top rope move in succession, where a wrestler will roll the way, so the other wrestler who does the top rope move lands, sells in the middle of the ring, then someone else climbs to the top, they go for a top rope move, the wrestler moves out of the way, they land, they sell, and it just happens. Everyone misses their move. Yeah, and I, and I actually of- and I actually wrote this down in a paragraph of like what exact. So like, Davis misses the top rope leg drop on Jacobs, then Spud misses the top rope frog splash on Davis, then Fury misses a shooting star press press on Spud, then Flanagan misses a um you know. Marrow salt on Fury. That's a reference to our last episode. <laughs> then Yang misses Yang time on Flanagan. Then Jacob goes for a top rope something with rip pants, but Yang catches him with a kick coming down that he no sells, which I was confused by. But yeah, so that that's the spot that you were describing. <laughs> yeah. Um so overall, I thought this was above average. I thought it was just eight minutes of dumb entertainment. They packed a lot of dives and top rope stuff into this match. Uh, as usual, I felt like Jay Fury kind of shined with his brief ring time, including he did like the coolest dive on the drive train. I continue to feel bad for Flash Flanagan. Not that I necessarily think like, oh, he should have been a regular Ring of Honor, but this was another match that he seemed kind of ill suited for and barely got to do anything. It seems like all his trout matches aren't really great show even great opportunities for him to really show anything um and i also did like that jimmy and yang really played up like that past history of jimmy the recent and match. jimmy and yang oh okay. jimmy jacobs and jimmy yang, the, the two jimmies you know much like that Dragon was good Gale. organization to separate the two so that there wasn't any confusion that's true that's true Fair <laughs> but enough. i i did i did like that they were playing up their history where yang on a recent show had 
brought a giant picture of Lacey to the ring and when Lacey couldn't work at a show and then humped it. And I liked how they still had that antagonism between each other. And you could even hear Lacey at one point yell at Jimmy Yang before the match going. She goes, I've heard about you. You're sick. So I like that even he, she's like acknowledging like, you know, I heard what you did. But overall, um, you know, decently dumb fun. Um, Matt, what did you think? Um, yeah, I thought this was a fun uh, scramble or six man mayhem or whatever you would say. I'd say it's, it was actually even more contrived than usual, but like not in a bad way. There was another contrived spot where Flanagan has Spud in a fallaway slam position, but then Fury tries to suplex Flanagan and can't because he's so big. So Yang hits a top rope drop kick to the back of Spud, who's being held by Flanagan, which allows Fury to have momentum to do the German suplex on Flanagan, who's holding Spud in the fallaway slam. So, you know, if you're going to do a ridiculous spot like that, I thought this was a pretty good one. So I enjoyed that. The, uh, the other funny thing was at the ending um, – so – the reaction, um, I I couldn't tell if this was a good character work or a bad character work. So for one, you would think that Jacobs would be way more excited because he was like he had to win this or else yeah. he was – you know. but he wasn't. He didn't act like this was a huge celebration and Lacey didn't either. Lacey was just like, uh, I can't believe you won. You never win. I don't know what's going on here. Put your pants on, which is a great series of sentences. But I don't know if Lacey <laughs> should have been happier that Jacobs won or if this was like good character work because she doesn't actually care about him. I couldn't decide if I thought it was good or bad, but I it was it was more muted than I expected, I guess, is what I would say. Uh, Jeff, how about your thoughts? So I'm going to go in the total opposite direction of both you guys. And I'm going to tell you guys, I love this match. <laughs> I absolutely love this match. I think this is the best Jimmy Yang Ring of Honor match from his entire run. It might be, honestly. Um, it might be the best performance by him. This is where he fits. Um, I was not, like, I'm not going to go out on a crazy limb and say, like, oh, this is a must-see scramble six-man mayhem, you know, flippy-do match. But, um if you're going to do contrived spots like they did where, you know, the, the segment where everyone misses in a row or uh, the uh, domino spot where you, you hit a move to hit a move to hit a move to hit a move um, that you brought up, Matt, uh, you you got to do it well. And I love this match for all those reasons. And it's something so totally different from everything else on this show. Did I justify putting it here and saying it belongs and it fits and it worked because it was a change of pace from everything else you see on this show. This whole show is a variety act. And in this match in particular, the character work of Jimmy Jacobs and uh, specifically to Lacey, my understanding of that story is Lacey is the code that can't be cracked. She's the sociopath. She's all about herself. She cares nothing about Jimmy or anybody else. And Jimmy is in love with her. And then it turns out that they finally both meet in the middle and now neither of them care. So they're both sociopaths. And that then you go into the age of the fall era. But Jimmy winning this match, kind of having that little interplay with Lacey at the end I thought was great um one story I wanted to get in on this podcast um about Spud uh in his trip to Cleveland uh up from Dayton so in one of the dark matches Apocalypse uh who some people know as uh Rick Victor from the Ascension um Victor of the Ascension I should say um those two are traveling with Brian Danielson and uh, the uh, dark match that Apocalypse was in was a four way with Bobby Dempsey, Mitch Franklin and uh, Hagedorn got the win. Uh, Chad Collier over Rhett Titus in the other dark match, by the way. Hmm. Um, but uh, there is an exit to go into downtown toward the Gray's Armory, Jacob's Field, the Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, uh, Gund Arena at the time. And um, 
it's it, it can generally have some pretty lengthy traffic because it's a one lane exit and you got to go around like a little loop. Spud had to pee. <laughs> traffic started moving. Brian, who is driving, decides to continue driving while Spud is peeing on my way. Oh, no. This tiny little British man. And Brian just thinks it's the funniest thing ever. So Spud jogs along the side of the highway to catch up. He catches up. Brian takes off. Spud catches up again. Brian takes off. And this continued on until they got off the highway and Brian had his fun. So uh, the world champion, a regular uh, jokester. But I love this match. I thought this was a better performance for Spud. I thought it was a great performance for Jay Fury uh, and Jimmy Yang's best performance. Trick Davis was in this match and Flash Flanagan's another guy. He was in the 1997 light heavyweight title tournament in the WWF. So <laughs> he's got to fit in a scramble match, right? Yeah. Which, which is so uh, funny when you, when you look at him compared to all the actual light heavyweights in this, in this match. Massive. Yeah, he's like the giant, not just in this match, but maybe like one of the big guys on this entire card. He's the WWF nineties. He's, he's height. Yeah, he's the yeah. WWF nineties conception of what a light heavyweight wrestler is, <laughs> which is so funny to me. It, it's so, so ridiculous, just unbelievable. So uh, yeah, I'm like Mike Matt said earlier. Immediately after winning, Jimmy uh, pulls down his trunks, and uh, Lacey's shocked that he won, saying that Jimmy never wins. Um, Flash Flanagan bails without doing the handshake. He gets booze for that. The crowd ends up doing a big spud chant, so they were big into him. And also, uh, Jeff, I'm glad you mentioned that Chad Collier worked a Ring of Honor student in a dark match because I could not find dark matches for this show, and that kind of helps make sense of something. I believe, Matt, we talked on a recent show. I had a note where, oh, they said Chad Collier was going to work with Ring of Honor students before going to Britain. I said, oh, I don't see that on the results. So clearly it did happen, even though I did not see it on the results. So that, that actually well, now makes sense. If you would like to uh, get access to those dark matches, you can. Uh, if you go on Twitter, uh, if Twitter is still a thing when this comes out, uh, and uh, Badger Grizzly Redwood, because he is in possession of all the dark <laughs> matches. And uh, it's a VHS tape that I just I want to borrow just for a couple of days so I can get it to a DVD and then he can have his precious back. Um <laughs> But I, uh, I, I am obsessed with hunting down and getting access to all the dark matches from over the years. Yeah, you got that um, completest itch. I, I can hear it whenever you guys used to talk about it on the show. Like, I well, and not, it's not only that, but I love watching young, inexperienced wrestlers get better step by step. Um, because I know, especially the ROH kids and calling them kids now when they're like 35 and some of them are promoting their own shows. Um, you know, like Ernie, uh, is completely out of wrestling Ernie Osiris. Um, but he's promoting the fight promotion, uh, which runs in New Jersey with Grizzly. So you're a big, um, so you're a big fan of NXT 2.0. Are you, <laughs> I no, not necessarily that too bright for me, but like, <laughs> also, the, the, also the, they're, they're getting better at like, doing wacky skits more than anything. I watched one NXT 2.0 where I kid you not, I could not name one person I saw as I was watching the show. Like they came out, they would do their entrances. They'd be in the ring, either having a match or doing a promo. And if you pause the screen and said, name this person, I would just look at you and go, uh, <laughs> I got nothing. Also, they also they give those people some pretty crazy names. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of like manufactured, you know, WWE, you know, name machine 2.0 uh, software that comes out and gives these people interesting names. But like the Ring of Honor students, though, I loved watching somebody like Rhett get better with every single try out there. I liked watching Hagedorn mix up his. Uh, trash talking to the fans. Um, I thought Derek Dempsey was somebody that had a lot of potential, just got hurt and didn't stick with wrestling, found something else that he was passionate about. 
Um, Grizzlies, another one, uh, going from the Mitch Franklin days into the Grizzly Redwood days, that transition. Um, even when he was main show Mitch and he was, you know, on the, the main cards doing his thing. Uh, and Pelly, uh, I think if we're going to name any student uh, that you saw that progression on the main shows, Pelly Primo, you know, made that jump from being the pre-show guy to the main show guy. And he hung in those big scramble matches with like Claudio and Shingo. And, uh, you know, he had a program with Jimmy Rave and I, that to me, that's what I enjoy about wrestling. I like seeing guys grow and progress and get better and better and better. And, uh, to me, you know, Jay Fury from dissension to this show, um, took a, a bunch of steps forward. So while not an ROH student, uh, we did solve the dark match, uh, for Chad Collier. We solved that <laughs> mystery. Another and, ring of uh, we've, also, we've talked about improvements of, of talents show to show. So, um, yeah, it was a, well, a fun scramble. <laughs> Next, we are going to talk about Claudio Castagnoli because he is up at this point in the balcony with a microphone. He's wearing his, uh, the the uh, special blazer jacket he had made for the Ring of Honor 100th show that had a ROH in sequins or rhinestones or whatever on the back of it and then that he tore at the end of the show in half. So the funny thing is he's wearing the jacket, even though it's torn in half, he's wearing it backwards so that you can see the Ring of Honor and the tear uh, as he talks, which looks ridiculous. Um, and then Claudio then opens up. He, he starts his – I love this. such a goofball. By seriously going, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste, <laughs> which, you know, it's not, quoting so Sympathy it's not, for so the Devil. So MJF is not the only AEW wrestler who is using Sympathy for the Devil to get nope. heat. So nope. um, he gets a loud shut the fuck up chant for his trouble along with a big Joe's going to kill, kill you chant. Uh, Claudio says he did not come here to fight. He came here to wrestle. Uh, he reminds fans he's part of the Kings of Wrestling with Chris Hero who can't be here. He's got prior commitments. He then takes off the torn jacket and fle- and he flexes. He uh, tells people he's the best athlete in Ring of Honor. And Claudio dares Samoa Joe to go hold for hold with him. Don't fight him tonight. Just wrestle. Uh, Joe's music hits. He, Samoa Joe, he makes his way to the ring. He grabs a mic of his own. He says, there's been a lot of talking tonight, so he'll keep this short, which I, I thought was almost like kind of a dig on Cornette, because at least from what we made the DVD, the only talking we saw tonight was that long from Cornette promo. So for to be like, well, there's been a lot of talking tonight. It's like, well, it, it could feel that way. Yeah, there was, um, but it was just by one person. It's, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's exactly what it was. It was yeah. it was a shot at, at Jim. Um. Joe then says that, you know, these people did not come here tonight to hear Claudio butcher the English language. Claudio makes a good point, points out, like, at least I can speak a second language. And then Joe just kind of assholely, in a, a very asshole manner, just goes, well, you don't speak it very well. And then he just starts mocking the way Claudio yeah, talks. Yeah, he, he does sort of like a stereotypical, like, almost like effeminate, like ger- like German sounding almost, like – like mockery, like Hans almost, and Franz. Yeah, ha, yeah. There's like a That's Hans and a little bit of Hans and Franz in there, a little bit of Dieter from Sprockets. So <laughs> definitely some SNL stuff. Yes. 90s uh, SNL references coming from Joe here. So uh, Claudio has Joe swear on his honor that it's going to be a wrestling match and not a fight tonight. Joe swears. He says and, 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 they're going to have a wrestling match tonight unless someone's a, a chicken. The crowd st- starts chanting, Joe's going to kill you. And Joe goes, shh. And he tells the crowd, like, I'm trying to get him to come down here and wrestle me. And so the crowd actually very cleverly and cutely then changes their chant from Joe's going to kill you to Joe's going to wrestle you, which I, I thought that was a good good, good uh, reaction from you, Jeff. And the Cleveland faithful to like play along with that way. And uh, Claudio does in fact make his way to the ring and we get Samoa Joe defeating Claudio Castagnoli by disqualification in 11 minutes, 57 seconds when Nate Webb uh, attacks Samoa Joe in a run in. Uh, Jeff, what'd you think about this? I did not know. Like you mentioned, that's another interesting note. This was the first, I guess of two times these guys were going to wrestle this weekend for different promotions. What'd you think about this match here? So I, uh, I didn't really care for the match. Uh, I know that's going to sound shocking. I like the verbal wordplay uh, back and forth um, between the two more than the actual wrestling aspect of things. Um, 
I kind of expected a little bit more aggression, even though they're supposed to quote unquote wrestle each other. I thought Joe would have shown more, more rage more because he's, you know, wasn't he an angry Samoan or whatever trope yeah. Cornette threw out earlier. Um, I, I thought, I thought the match felt like it was sort of like uh, a TV match. Um, the verbal play uh, at the start was so good that I was expecting them to come down and get pretty heated pretty fast. And they really didn't. Um, also, uh, when Claudio said, I'm a man of, uh, please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. Uh, I did not let him get, I'm a man of wealth and taste out because I uttered the words, my name is Hove. Uh, if we're looking to, <laughs> Uh, go into other music genres beside the Rolling Stones. Uh, that would be Jay Z. Uh, but uh, if you guys and Trevor, I know you saw it, but Joe's media scrum at Final Battle, um, the like cooler, the coolest guy in the room <laughs> yeah. persona that he he was doing there. Uh, you know, they went. He wanted to be addressed as like the king of TV. Your Majesty, Your Highness, etc., and that that sarcasm, that wit, that personality—that was what the promo was. And then the match just felt like, eh, we'll have a nice TV match for nine minutes or whatever it was. Um, I would like to have seen these two have like a, a just a killer of a fight, yeah, and uh, you know, hard hitting back and forth match, but it didn't feel like that. Um, Matt, what do you think? And I have a feeling we're all going to feel the same about this match. But Matt, maybe you, uh, maybe you'll feel different. What do you think? Yeah, like so, like I, I appreciated that in the promo. You know, like they did what you always compliment Gabe for, which is give a reason for something. Like there was obviously some reason why they were not going to have an intense fight here. So Gabe booked a promo where they explained why. You know, where Claudio yeah. kind of, mm-hmm. you know, um, asked Joe to, um. To uh, I, I can can um, you know I should have commit to not having the kind of intense fight that you would expect here, um, which makes sense. Um, but unfortunately, what it led to was a match that sucked. Um, so <laughs> like like and obviously like it didn't really suck. Like it's because like they're two really competent great wrestlers, but. Considering that it's Samoa Joe versus Claudio, the match sucked. Like, the crowd wasn't that hot for it. It was slow. It was very basic. It just wasn't that interesting. Like, Claudio was stalling so much at the beginning, he was going to make Jimmy Rave jealous. Um, But, you know, I do have some notes here. Like, um, I do like when Joe was working Claudio's nose at the beginning. (laughs) Because that's always fun when wrestlers work. He pinched his nose. That was fun. And smacked it. There was also a moment where... Prazak mentioned that Hero was in Canada, and Lenny Leonard says, lots of people run to Canada when they don't want to fight. <laughs> and I'm like, is, is Lenny Leonard throwing shade at people who tried to avoid the draft during Vietnam? Is that what he's in doing? In your face! Yeah, <laughs> draft dodgers. Like, I, that was weird. Um, but, um, no, the other, other like, there was another spot, you know, where he, like, Joe did his little nope walk away when Claudia went for a crossbody off the middle turnbuckle. So it's not like this match was without his um without without its charms but i still you know i still just thought it was so much worse than anything you could have expected between these two in any era then or now if they had a match so it's like i guess what the annoying part is like joe i mean they they just were they obviously were not trying like so like to have a great match they were just trying to like have a low gear let's advance the story match and, you know, an ROH, that's always going to be disappointing. Obviously, we're firmly in the Joe can't always go full bore in ROH anymore era. And it's just going to be true until the end of his run in ROH. Um, um, and there's always going to be – like, not always, but there's going to be so many examples coming up of where, okay, this was booked this way, so Joe didn't have to overexert himself outside of TNA. And I understand, and I don't blame Joe, but it still makes for, you know, disappointing matches sometimes, and this was one of them. Yeah, so, um, oh, go on. Jeff. I, I, I wanted to throw throw something out there with Joe. Like, the, the thing to me about Joe that makes him my all-time favorite wrestler is 
that he just emanates this like indescribable it factor. He has it, whatever it is. So even a match like this that is way below what you would expect, especially considering who he's wrestling, uh, it, it's still f- fine, I guess. Like there's a way, there's always a way to justify it. And it's pushing a story. Like when I said it's, it felt like a TV match, most TV matches are, you know, moving the storyline along. And, and that's fine. I'm all for, you know, 2006 Samoa Joe sacrificing himself in Cleveland by doing, you know, hardly anything, but still getting in and playing the hits. Like the, the nope, I'm not taking that spot, moving uh, on a dive or the nose punch, uh, you know, like the little things that makes Joe so charming as a character, he's still able to do, even though there's nothing else to hold on to with the match. Yeah, I, I, I wonder say- if this will ever, this will match will end up being like a, in the near future, Ring of Honor pay-per-view main event, because it could conceivably be that. That would be interesting. I mean, it's literally the world champion of Ring of Honor versus and, the TV champion right now. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yep. the, the funny thing is you were mentioning a point where um, you were saying, you know, you were shocked, uh, you know, that these guys had a match that, that was this, like, bland and average. Like, I was just thinking, you know, these two guys, the, the match we're watching here on Ring of Honor at this point, they're in their physical primes. I'd be shocked if you threw them these two guys now out in their 40s against each other for 10 minutes on dynamite or something that they would not have a match far better than this. Like Yeah, well for what I mean like oh, God, so, so, yeah. so obviously like Joe is way past his physical prime. Like and he doesn't have the level of great matches frequently the way he did back then. Or he he has had a couple recently that were really good. Claudio got mm-hmm. way better after this. Um, so, you know, I think to the point where, you know, you might expect Claudio to carry a match like this now. But when we talk about Samoa Joe in 2022 and about to be 2023, it's painful for me when I think that we could have had Joe and Punk again, and we're not going to, and I'm so mad about it. Well, not mad, but I'm sad. Maybe, I'm sad. I'm maybe sad. let's hope cooler heads prevail. And yeah, maybe that's right. Heal, have, yes, that's right. Heal up Punk. I'm trying to expel positive wishes into the air yes 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 uh i i, I mean i'm i'm not taking any sides in that fight but or <laughs> CM, CM, CM or whatever punk, it was cm punk might leave aew it's not confirmed but you know maybe he'll leave aew and go to roh right <laughs> <laughs> well yeah yeah <laughs> yeah that's it <laughs> i i appreciate He's out. You can always go home again. That's right. <laughs> I appreciate the positive vibes. I will say I'm going to have to be a little bit negative right here because I agree with you guys. I, I, I would say this isn't the, uh, <laughs> this isn't a terrible match. And I wouldn't say this is one of the worst matches we've seen in the years of doing through the years, but no, I would say not. this is one of the most disappointing. Yes. Like the gap between oh, what yeah. you know these guys could have done. And what you actually got that might, this might be one of the widest gaps we've ever seen on the show. Um, this is like low average, uh, Jeff, I think you did great saying it was like a TV match. I almost describe it as like an eighties house show match where it had a very old school heel yeah. psychology, like lots of Claudio bailing out early. Like Matt said, like Joe almost at some points kind of being just bemused by Claudio and almost not taking him seriously, which I get it. You know, it's, it was kind of fun, but also, Almost a little too lighthearted considering this is supposed to be a like blood feud and almost also a little too dismissive of Claudio. Like he's like Joe really treats Claudio here like he's kind of nothing, you know, in a lot of to a, a big degree, very low thrills, very slowly paced. And I do like that they went out of their way to explain why. Why aren't – why isn't Joe just going for broke against this guy who just stabbed Ring of Honor in the back? But at the same time, part of me wonders like from a non-storyline purpose, why did they book it this way? Like was one of these two guys kind of sore? Did someone just call on a – like did Joe call on a favor just be like, you know what? Could I just have a way to take it easier tonight? Did Gabe just feel like this would burn out the crowd for the next match? I mean I, I, I don't see that being a possibility. But I just thought why would you book a – when everyone would expect going into the show – you know, that Claudio and Joe's just going to be this full tilt, you know, intense match. Why would you book it? Give it a reason to be like, oh, 
this is going to be kind of more of a jokey, slow paced, just kind of their standard wrestling match. And then, well, when you notice what Joe does on the next two shows in May, like you'll see, this is this is a pattern of like there's mm-hmm. like there Joe somehow does not have the full Joe experience match that you expect him to on a few shows in a row here. But I will say going to Jeff's point, because I thought Jeff made a good point that one, th- I think maybe this is kind of what you're, maybe this is more of kind of what you're hinting at or alluding to Jeff, but I would say like Joe is a guy where there are some wrestlers where if they wrestle at like 60 or 70%, like I, if I, if I really love wrestlers, I'll be always disappointed if they don't go full bore usually. Cause I just know how great they are. But like I feel like a lot of wrestlers, if they go at sixty or seventy percent, you know, you're disappointed. But there are some wrestlers where like they have such an aura and such charisma, and they even they're like the matches where they kind of take a half step back. Their big moves are cool enough, and they hit the always hit them well enough. That's almost like they can kind of take a step back, and a lot of fans will still be happy. Like, and I get the vibe like. If I was in that crowd, I would have been really bummed for this match. But I could see some fans, even in this crowd, just being like, you know what? I still kind of got to see Samoa Joe be Samoa Joe. You know, because he will always at least give you kind of that flavor of his personality and his style. And I feel like some wrestlers can't get away with that. I think Joe can. You know, you can still feel like you kind of got to see him, even if he's not giving you the fantastic, I'm going to just really empty the tank, take some real physical abuse kind of match. The ending, so, the- Trevor. Oh, go on. I I I want to be real specific on that point. I, I do think like sixty percent of Joe is fine, yeah, because he does have so much personality. But I don't think that applies to everyone. Like I think it applied to Punk, and I think Punk tried to go like a thousand percent instead of just like easing his way in, and that's why he kept getting hurt. Yeah. Um. In this most recent run, and I. Hey, I I thought the match he had with Will Hobbs at Grand Slam was great because it was like a house show punk match. And he was okay afterwards, and you got to see him do his entrance and, you know, uh, have a good match and go home safely. Um, yeah, and, and and yeah, I like but, I, punk. Punk had so many matches like that in that run. Like I was just looking through my old photos, and I remembered like I had totally forgotten about this match that CM Punk had. A, like I saw live a good singles match on TV against John Silver, and I was like, man, like he just yep. had like a bunch of like good matches against like up and coming guys. That is just like, man, man, am I sad about all this? It, <laughs> it, Positivity, it makes me sad, but like. There, there is one wrestler that I was never a big fan of that has that aura to him that he can give you 60, 50 or 60 percent even uh, and only do it like once a year. Uh, he goes by the name Undertaker. I know him as the guy <laughs> with the MAGA T-shirts um, that claims to be a dead man. Um, he was another one that could get away with doing like 50 percent effort. And his body was broken down at the end and people just were there for the entrance and that was it. Yeah. I mean, there's some wrestlers where they just have a good aura. Just seeing them is almost a treat in addition to them being like seeing them do something great. And yeah, Joe was one of those guys and not, you know, not everyone can, not everyone has that kind of charisma and aura and presence where they can get away with that. But Joe could and, you know, in some ways mm-hmm. it's disappointing, but I guess you also can't blame. I mean, if Joe went all out in every match, maybe he's not wrestling today. You know, I mean, you, no, you, he's in you, the regal position. Like his knee at this point, um, I want to say he had knee surgery in like the fall of two thousand six. Uh, but like his knee was hurt at this point, like yeah, legit. So, um. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I probably would have wanted to see, you know, this be 25 minutes of just, you know, two big meaty men slapping meat. But is it logical? Do you, or do you want him around for another 11 months that you have him or do you want him like yanked by the evil Jeff Jarrett? Yeah, and I, I think I brought this up maybe years ago, but something I always remember is I've heard other people talk about this with New Japan. Like Okada, for years, there was this thing where like he would be putting in like a, a if not an A effort, at least like a strong B plus effort, like even on the most minor, you know, 
random tags on small little house show spots in New Japan. And then there got to be a point where he adds a few injuries and gets a little older. And there became a clear point where it was like, he's still Okada in all the big matches. But if it's not a big match, you know, he's not, he, he's very much kind of like, maybe not quite this level of Samoa Joe in this match, because even Joe wasn't this level of Joe, maybe every match, but like, you know, he's clearly going, I'm safe. You, you can tell certain, I think a lot of wrestlers, they get to a certain age where they realize I only have so many all out performances left in me. And if I want to stretch this career out, I have to save them. And I think clearly in the last year we've been watching on through the years, at least in Ring of Honor, I think we've seen Joe realize, and maybe like you were saying, with some of those injuries, he was starting to suffer at this point, realizing like, I can still be peak Samoa Joe, but I can't be him every weekend. Cause it just, and he started putting on weight too around this time, and it just – I I don't blame him at all. I have no ill will toward that guy. Like As far as I'm concerned, if – if I had my way, they'd build a statue of him yeah, in my I neighborhood. Mean, I, I think he's literally the greatest wrestler in Ring of Honor history. But, uh, yeah, I mean, but it was weird because, you know, he is in that stage where, like, Matt and I have been starting to see this from Joe, like, before even Joe versus Kobashi. But then you watch Joe versus Kobashi and it's like, oh, he can just flick that switch, you know, and be everything he ever was. Well, because but he, he was just still, has to save he was still it. doing it in TNA. Like it was yeah, not, it's not exactly. like he wasn't like doing it. Like mid TNA matches and stuff, he just had to save it. You know, he was picking and choosing now when to be Samoa Joe, like at 100%, which again, that's that's part of wrestling. Eventually, I think most wrestlers get to that stage. But You only have one body. You got to try to be as smart as yeah. you can with it. Although, you know, Joe did that flying drop kick onto the yeah. steps against Sting, which is not yeah, being smart Sting. with it. But besides that. <laughs> it was Sting. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, now, um, nowadays that, it would be Sting who was quote. doing that drop kick, right? Like, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> that's a direct quote from Samoa Joe, by the way. Um, <laughs> and it was an interview that he did with Mike Johnson. He was, Mike asked him about that bump down the steps, and he goes, "It was Sting." <laughs> what else? Um, so I, I, I did want. I have one final known this match. This maybe is tells you how. Not good this match was. This was my favorite mode of the match. Claudio, I don't know if you guys know us, on the outside, there was a fan heckling him. And Claudio had maybe the most adorable, adorably gentle heck, response to a heckle I have seen in the history of life. Uh, so I forget what the fan was doing to heckle him. But Claudio then turns to the fan, heel Claudio and goes, I'm doing better than you think. <laughs> like, that's like the most, not like screw you or anything like He's just like, yeah, you're being a little harsh. <laughs> you know, I'm you, doing okay. You know what's funny about that? I noticed that Jimmy Rave in the main event did something similar to a heckler yes. where he goes, I'm winning he on said points. To a young kid. <laughs> yes. He, he, well, even like at the, after the, the toilet paper shower and he's standing in the corner and they're doing the, the, uh, the like you know the butt pat from Shelly and and Rave goes through the ropes and Jimmy Fetterman puts his camera up on Jimmy and Jimmy's telling a fan like the the fans chanting die Jimmy die and Jimmy's like I don't think you should be saying that that's not very kind <laughs> that, that's the uh, that's the kind of healing I enjoy the more understated just like why yes. would you say that to me <laughs> like uh, that stuff's always good but um after the match Necro Butcher joins Webb in attacking Joe. Uh, Necro hits Joe in the knee over and over with a steel chair. A steel on Adam Pierce, who now his uh, towel is, that he had his head wrapped in on the angle before it now has blood on it. They run in the ring. They brawl with them at ringside. As Dave Prasek says, we've got to get out of here. You know, they're they're going to get near the uh, the announce position that no one ever sees because it doesn't really exist because we're the, taping this in post production. The FIP mobile. <laughs> FIP Mobile Studios. So, um, Web, Nate Webb then takes a huge bump he, on uh, Adam Pierce Beal, Beals him over the guardrail into a bunch of open chairs. Uh, all four men brawl in the crowd, but eventually they make their way back to the ring. Uh, Pierce Dragon suplexes Webb into the turnbuckles, and Webb takes the bump basically like head over heels, uh, or heels over head, I don't know. <laughs> As Necro battles uh, Ace on the floor, a fan tells him, he's a Republican, Necro. He's a Republican. And back, I just back thought, when that would have made Necro Butcher mad. <laughs> yeah, like now. That it was would, I, the funny, it's the funniest moment of this whole show. <laughs> Hands down. 
Yeah, like and like that fan did not know the <laughs> the future. Um, uh, Pierce pile drives Nate Webb on the hardwood floor. Necro goes to power bomb Ace on two open chairs, but instead, uh, Pierce stops him. Ace does the usual bump that Necro always does, which is uh, they turn the chairs around so that the backs are facing each other. And then uh, Ace and Adam Pierce give Necro a very crappy uh, that Necro doesn't get very high up for double power bomb on the two chairs, turn back to back. Uh, Ace goes to Tombstone Web off the second turnbuckle when Super Dragon runs to the ring, attacks the Ring of Honor wrestlers, a loud super F-word slur for gay people's chant from those fans as uh, everyone brawls. Uh, Steel power bombs Web mm-hmm. onto another open chair, and then BJ Whitmer in a neck collar runs into the ring. He attacks Super Dragon. The crowd chants for Whitmer and Dragon. Uh, Dragon, I think, takes a nasty-looking bump over the guardrail. We see Ace and Pierce walking all the way out of the building, chairs in hand, as Whitmer is now alone with Dragon. He throws him back in the ring. Ref joins them. Commentary joins them. Bell rings. We've gotten a match here. BJ Whitmer defeats B- Super Dragon via pinball in 12 minutes, 11 seconds, after he hits an exploder off the top through two tables on the floor. Um Dave Meltzer would note in The Observer, this feud has legs. He's talking about the CZW Ring of Honor feud. And it's still going to be kept going until it eventually dies of natural causes, as all feuds do. However, this was designed as the blow-off for Dragon, at least for now. So, yeah, this was very, this is the last time you're going to see Super Dragon in Ring of Honor. And looking at Cage Match, this is actually – um like Super Dragon was basically running down his career as an indie wrestler in anywhere – but his own home promotion, PWG, because basically not very long after this, he's basically pretty much with rare exceptions, a PWG exclusive wrestler. And not long after this, actually, he's rarely even working for them in the ring. So this is kind of the end of an era there. Um, Matt, what do you think about, you know, they've been kind of, this is kind of a mini feud where they hadn't done much together, but it feels like every time BJ Whitmer was in the ring with super dragon, they were doing like a crazy death spot. And so, this is kind of like another mini feud that gets ended on the show. What do you think about it? Well, first of all, the fact that it's interesting to hear that Dave wrote that the CZW versus ROH feud would eventually keep going until it died of natural causes because I think one of the biggest compliments you could pay Gabe Sapolsky is that he did not let that happen. Like he ended it when he wanted mm-hmm. to at a climactic moment and no one looks back on it with anything other than you know, fondness and being impressed by how well it went. And, you know, you know, they probably could have gotten more out of it, but the fact is they didn't try and that made it better. So I think that this is a good time to express that, um, that sentiment that Gabe did something that he didn't have to do and he did a great job. But, um, as far as this match, um, you know, it's one of the things like it was, it's this, okay. So clearly the crowd that was there was into the CZW feud because this match was very hot and very, very, very fun. Like, it was a really good, entertaining brawl. If you could get out of your head that BJ Whitmer was not selling his broken neck other than to occasionally touch his neck and go, ah! But, like, he, everything, <laughs> he did everything that he would have done otherwise. Um, it was actually pretty funny because there was a moment early where Prazak, because they go back to the booth, right? Prazak and Leonard. And Prazak says, BJ Whitmer probably shouldn't even be wrestling. And I'm like, <laughs> Probably. Probably. Like, what do you, did, what did you say his injury was? Like, I, I, but like that, that's just that cognitive dissonance. I'm not going to get completely over it, but I tried and I did enjoy this. Like, I, you know, they, they just do a lot of big spots. You know, they, they do the stuff with, um, so Dragon does work the neck. He rips off the neck brace. He curb stomps BJ headfirst into a chair and, and tries to pin him with one finger, which was, you know, a fun heel move. Um, but BJ does not sell like he's a guy who's about to be pinned with one finger. You know, he's not, he's never like, oh, he's out. He's out of it and then makes a big comeback. He's just like in it the whole time. But Dragon does do the thing where he puts BJ's head on the propped up chair like he did the last two times. And he goes up top, but BJ pops up, crotches Super Dragon, knocks him off the top rope. And they, they tease a top rope exploder. They, he fights that off. Um, BJ hits a big lariat and an exploder with his knee. He sets up the timekeeper's table, so we know that's coming into play later because as far as I can think, the only match in history where they set up a table at ringside and tease that they're going to use it and never use it 
and it's not disappointing, is that Briscoes versus FTR dog collar match. That's the only time I can ever remember that. So because in this, so in this match, they set up the table and they will, in fact, eventually use it. Um, they do, you know, a bunch of teases about the, with the psycho driver through the table. BJ escapes. He knocks Dragon off the apron and Dragon hits a sp- sp- springboard kick to the back of BJ's head. And then he hits this like crazy spinning power bomb off the top rope that I'm not even sure was intentional, but it looked cool. And BJ it kicked out. Awesome. Yeah, it looked really cool. And at this point, I noticed the entire crowd is standing for this, which you really don't get that often. That didn't even happen in Joe versus Kobashi. In fact, when people tried to stand, they got yelled at to sit the fuck down. So <laughs> that just shows you the yep. difference between uh, Cleveland and uh, New York City. But um, we're you know, nice. Yes, yes, that's true. <laughs> um, but so, so Dragon sets up another table side by side with the first one. Again, they tease the psycho driver off the middle rope this time, but BJ fights out and then exploders him off the top rope through both tables. BJ definitely looks like he goes through the table as much as Dragon does, but and BJ has a big cut on his back after the move, but he does put Dragon back in the ring and pin him. Um, so this was really hot. It was just it was completely big moves the whole time. So and the crowd was into it. I don't know. Like, if you have a pulse, I don't know how you could find that anything but exciting and entertaining. So I found this very exciting and very entertaining. Jeff, do you have a pulse or not? What do you think? <laughs> uh, I do. Uh, I mean, if you ask my Apple Watch, uh, which I'm on my third Apple Watch in three days, uh, they oh. tell you I don't have a pulse. But uh, nevertheless, um, I thought this was just the only time I've ever seen Super Dragon and thought, there might be something here. Hmm. Uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, but four total appearances of Super Dragon in ROH? That I can yeah, think of, yep. He, oh, well, he wasn't well, in much. Well, I guess there was a do or die, right? So I guess maybe five. Oh, yeah, the Excalibur yes. do or die match, yeah, which would be yes, years where earlier. He, he concusses Excalibur and yes, I – I guess we'll count that. So, like three, three is part of the CGW story, and then the do or die with with uh, good old Excalibur. And uh, I, I thought this was the only time that I was like, oh, like you mentioned the spinning blue thunder bomb from the second rope. Uh, I was like, oh, I wonder if that was intentional because that was fucking awesome. Uh, and. I remember uh, another little thing where, like, when the first table is set up and Super Dragon, like, goes the wrong way around the ring and he does this, like, little roll over the table and then middle fingers the fans. (laughs) It's such a little, like, heel move to do that. But it worked. And it worked for that audience who probably in – if I had to, to count on one hand the number of people that were in that crowd that saw Super Dragon in person before or watched him on DVD, DVD, I would say less than half. In person, I'd say less than 25, maybe. Um, so for him to get that reaction off of just doing a little, you know, roll over a table to get to the other side instead of going under it or moving it or whatever. I thought was brilliant. Um, The psycho driver from the second rope tease was scary as hell. Um, At least from the angle that I was at, um, I thought the, the the rope was like going to give out and pull from the the buckle in the corner. Um, But they safely made, made their way through and then the exploder through the tables uh that that's the exclamation point on the match um i i mean it's one of the loudest uh kabooms you hear uh all night and uh it's certainly one of the louder things i've ever heard at a show um i also want to mention that you know when they come back out, you know, go into this match and Super Dragon runs out. There were a lot of people that were like kind of shocked that he was there and that 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 was a thing. Um I I didn't know Super Dragon was there. Um I don't remember him being announced as being a part of the 
CZW Invaders. Uh, but I mean, this was this was a lot of fun. Uh, it was very intense, and I thought the fans did a great job of rallying for BJ. Um, you know, BJ is not a local by any stretch. He's from Cincinnati, so all the way on the other side of the states. Uh, but you know, he's an Ohio guy, so I guess we got to stick up for each other. Um, and he's, you know, Mr. ROH at this point. So I love this. Uh, it was the perfect part of the BJ Whitmer story inside the CZW versus ROH story. Uh, because each of the, the representatives beside a steal, which I think is a crime, uh, Pierce, Homicide, Joe, and BJ, they all had their own little story inside of the bigger themed story that was ROH versus CZW. Yeah, um, I thought this was a good match, but I thought it was a really satisfying conclusion to the Whitmer Super Dragon mini feud. It was, in some ways, it was a little slower paced, but I thought this was a case where that was understandable because it was like, BJ wasn't selling his neck in specific, but a bunch of this match is him just selling in general. And it, it's, a, uh, you know, it's a lot of, when there are hitting moves, it's really, these really big showcase moves. And I, uh, I really liked how they teased some of the big spots Super Dragon had done to Whitmer in the past, because basically their whole feud was when these guys get in the ring together, Super Dragon nearly kills Whitmer. So I like the idea that, you know, they try and he tries to do the top rope double stop to the head with uh, Whitmer's head on the chair, on the open chair. And this time Whitmer avoids it. You know, he, like Jeff mentioned, he tries to do the psycho driver through a table, but this time Whitmer blocks it. And then, you know, finally, it's it's BJ who destroys him with one of those big, crazy moves, the exploder off the top through two tables on the floor. And, yeah, I, I thought this was uh, fun in terms of – I feel like you would enjoy it if you didn't know the context of the feud, but knowing just – seeing I, I view it better even as a wrap-up than as a match it, it's fun just to see like oh yeah finally Whitmer kind of gets his revenge and Whitmer was very much at this point in Ring of Honor being kind of pushed in the Tommy Dreamer mold of man this yep. guy takes so much punishment man he always shouldn't be wrestling I mean Gabe is camering at home every show recently he shouldn't be wrestling but he it does anyway because he's such a fighter and it was working like I would say this is probably the most over BJ Whitmer had ever been, you know, he was getting chance at this point. Possibly and, have ever been and would ever be, probably. Yeah, I mean, this it, it was working. You know, the guy who's kind of like sacrificing his body again and again and again for this company more than anybody else, probably at this point. Um. So yeah, immediately you know, the, I, there's oh go on. There's one more thing I want to mention about this this match, uh, and and maybe Trevor, you're going to get to it here in a second, but um. The one thing I felt like was missing after the big exploder 99 through the uh, the set of tables was like a, a button that like Dave or Lenny would press and it would just be Gabe yelling, Dangerous! <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah, I mean, that, you, that's definitely one where you could have guaranteed he would have said it. But uh, yeah, after the match, what we do get is Ace and Pierce check on Whitmer, who slowly recovers. The crowd chants for Whitmer, the crowd chant for ROH. BJ gets on the mic, he tells Adam and Ace to get this piece of trash out of here. And then I actually kind of, I like this. I mean, this was a very giving right out from um, Super Dragon's point because Ace mm -hmm. Steele and Adam Pierce proceed to drag a completely limp, and by completely limp, I mean he's completely dead wait waiting it, Super Dragon out of the building, you know, to the point where the camera falls him and they we see him th getting dumped like a sack of shit on the cement sidewalk like in front of the building. I and think then they, they might just even walk call him a sack of shit at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and yes. they just they, they just dump this him there. The line was, this is where we'll leave this piece of trash here for Cleveland's finest. Yeah, and, and they they, they uh, return to the building. They high-five the front row. Pierce screams, fuck yeah. Like, they're really celebrating. And, like, that's the last time you ever see Super Dragon Ring of Honor is getting dumped off in the front of the building like garbage. And, you know, if nothing else you can say about Super Dragon in this feud, I mean, I think he did some cool spots, and I think he has a cool presence. But, like, you can't say he didn't, like – completely show ass on the way out. Like he got about as strong a loss as you could have here. And yeah, one of the first big kind of wins for the ring of honor side in this feud, you really feel like where they're really celebrating like, Hey, we've taken this guy out. 
And um, it's not so, so the oh, uh, the the spot where Super Dragon got dumped. Uh, that is the same spot where Loki and Homicide pulled a van onto the sidewalk and sold Rottweilers merch, <laughs> and were told not to. Same exact, like literally, if you did a chalk outline, it would be right where Super Dragon was, and. Uh, as you mentioned, like Super Dragon was dead weight and he's being dragged and Pierce like gives him a little bit of a receipt and just drops him on the bottom step. Jesus. Like it, he he just I don't know, like kind of lets him lets his hips. They were trying to safely get him down those steps and Pierce is finally just like uh, and then drops him <laughs> and you you can see. Super Dragon's like tailbone just whacked oh. that bottom step, and I just went, "Oh, good lord, that's, that's gotta big, hurt." Because I feel like Super Dragon's rep, like I've heard in like shooter reviews and stuff, is like he could be kind of an asshole and kind of push people, yeah, to to, to like you know take bigger moves than maybe they were comfortable with and like hit them harder. But I, this doesn't justify. But the the thing that also people would say is he would expect you to do the same to him. So in a way, it, it's it's kind of fitting that if his last thing is him like getting hurt, you know, getting kind he of roughly treated, just yeah, he would probably tell you that's what I want. You know, I'm going to give it to you, and mm-hmm. you give it back to me. You know, maybe not always, but that's what I've heard some people say about him. But it's I uh, don't think there was any love lost in between Adam and Super Dragon. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, now intermission, and Dave plays X backstage with the embassy, Alex Shelley, Jimmy Ray, D- Daisy Hayes. Prince Nana's not there again because this is a Midwest weekend, and they didn't want a spring probably for Nana to drive down. Um Prezak asks where Prince Nana is, and Shelley says he's back in Ghana already starting the celebration because he knows they're going to win the World Tag Team title tonight and Shelly says they know all of Generation Next's secrets raises the crown jewels going to win his first title in Ring of Honor so the, the, I love these guys they're, I've been one of my favorite acts of the last few months but there is something missing when Nana's not back there with them I, uh, I, I miss Nana also Shelly's Shelly's delivery of uh, Nana uh, being in Ghana awaiting the tag titles to enter the country <laughs> like some foreign dignitary is coming to the country they're waiting for the tag team titles of Ring of Honor to enter also I just yeah Shelly misidentified Nana in Ghana as being alliteration which it is absolutely not <laughs> but but then he corrects himself and says that it's a rhyme which is which it is um, but it reminded me of when Kevin Nash famously called play an adjective, which it is also yep. not. <laughs> yep. So uh, it, it, that that brings us to the start great. of of our um, big triple main event. I guess they didn't really build as that, but these were like the three big matches on the card that were pre-announced and did not change. Uh, Christopher Daniels defeats Matt Seidel via pinfall in 18 minutes 23 seconds after he hit the last rights. So Jeff, I'm going to let you go first, but first I just want to say something that's really bizarre logic here. So. Um, for those who haven't been keeping up with the show or Ring of Honor at this period, this is a rematch because of the last time they were in Cleveland, the last time you were on the show, these guys had a singles match. Daniels got legitimately hurt um, very er- early on on, I think, a hip toss of all things. He just took it kind of weird and he jammed his knee or something. Yep. And he he worked the full match. He won the match and he had to get like some minor knee surgery. He was out a few weeks because of it. And so now they're doing a rematch here. And – um so there's really bizarre logic here because Dave Prezak on commentary explains the story of this match. He goes, this is a rematch from the match these two had the last time they were in Cleveland where Daniel suffered a freak injury. All true. And then Prezak goes on to say, Ring of Honor booked this rematch to see who is the better man when both men are at 100%, which is normally good logic until you realize Daniels won the last match. So it's like, what's the logic here like? Daniels won the last match when he was not 100%. Can he win when he's 100%? Like, that doesn't make sense. But uh, apart from that, I thought that logic was was, well, was yeah, well, not good. But in Ring of Honor language, that's code for, let's see how good of a match they can both have with yeah. each other when they're both 100%. Because yep. that's really what it was. Yeah. So We're uh, trying to sell DVDs here. This is a work rate company. <laughs> So, uh, Jeff, what did you think then? Did they did they accomplish that here on the rematch in Cleveland? They doubled down on disappointment. Um, to me, I this match was like five minutes too long, in my opinion. Uh, I thought the first about 
eight minutes were just painfully slow. And I know they, they said like Seidel hurt his ankle. I don't remember whether that was a legitimate thing or not. I kind of feel like it wasn't, but um, I was trying to remember back to when we did, did this show for the, for an honorable mention. And I, don't remember if Hagedorn even recalled whether it was legit or not. But I just thought it was such a slow start to this match. The last, like, five, six minutes I thought were fine. Um, but this is, one, this is like, the first 2006-era Matt Seidel match I've watched in quite some time. And I got to say, he, he may have had the worst-looking gear in all of the indies <laughs> uh, at this point. Those blue tights... I don't know what color they originally were, but good Lord, it's such a distraction. Um, But as far as the wrestling goes, I thought it was okay. But then there'd be times where like Seidel was not selling the ankle. So maybe burst of adrenaline or whatever other pro wrestling excuse you want to give it. I don't know. But I just thought this was a case of two really, really great wrestlers as individuals that just don't work well together. Uh, I, I like this a little more than you, but I also thought it was, I thought it was like kind of a low, good match, kind of blandly solid. And it was probably too long. Uh, here's my problem with it, which is something I've talked about, I think a long time ago, because you see this kind of match often on the indies, which is, when a more established guy is working like a less est- lower guy on the totem pole, but he's going to beat that younger, lower ranked guy. A lot of times to be generous, you'll see matches like this where he'll be like, I'm going to sell most of the match. You're going to get to hit me with a billion moves and then I'll just win on the end. And that can be good. It can, it can get the younger guy over and it's a very kind kind of thing. But I feel like if you let the guy that's losing have too much of the match and you win too abruptly, it almost makes him look kind of like a wimp. Like, he, you hit the other guy with this many moves and he hits you really quick. And I felt like this match, so much of this match is just Daniel. I mean, ja- Daniels gets some stuff in, but so much of this match is Daniel selling Seidel working mm-hmm. over a body part. And it almost feels like side Daniels is just laying there a lot of time being like, do all your stuff, man. You know, I'll, I'll just take it here. You know, you, and then right near the end of the match, you know, Seidel's on this big run of offense. And then he makes like one mistake Daniels immediately hits the last rights and it's over. And it was like just such like one move against like such a heavy flow of offense. And it was one of those things where I was like, I did feel like you almost went too far being generous. Occasionally that can happen. And I felt that was the case here. The ankle thing was also weird. I agree. I was wondering, is that a weird, an ankle, like a legit injury or not? I I, part of me thought maybe they're doing that because it kind of felt like the Daniels thing, which was a very innocuous thing where you go, how did he even get hurt there? And then much like the, the Daniels thing, though, it doesn't really factor into it. So I thought either either they did a weird story that Seidel immediately started to ignore, like you said, or it was just like the Daniels thing where he suffers a legit injury, but then just kind of you won't really know it after a few minutes because he just kind of ignores it and goes, I'm just going to work through it either way. Um it was technically sound, but in some had definitely had some dull moments. And it was also a weird match from the crowd standpoint because I felt like there was periods of this match where the crowd was probably quieter for this than most matches on the card. But then there would also be times where they would just pop fairly loudly, like randomly, like sometimes. Like there's a moment where um Seidel puts Daniels in a abdominal stretch and the fans give a big round of applause. And I have no idea why. Like, I don't even think it was the first abdominal stretch of the match, but then there'd be other moments where they were pretty dead quiet. And there'd also be a moments where they would chant. This is awesome. So it was, it was that kind of match, I would say. And I've seen Daniels have quite a few matches like this. Um, Matt, what'd you think about it? Well, I was the high vote um, on the uh, on the first match between these two at um, at the Sension, and I guess I'm going to be the high vote again. I really, really like this match a lot. Like, I thought it was better than the first one, and I liked the first one. Um, I thought it was a good match, but I also thought it was really good character work. I thought that both guys um, showed more intensity. And I, I, to the point where, like, Seidel was, like, showing desperation. And then I noticed, because I haven't really liked Daniels that much in ROH in this in this run. Um, I thought he showed a lot more intensity and urgency 
than he usually does in ROH also. Like he was clearly trying to, you know, hold the line against this up and coming guy. So like his offense just felt just had a little bit more pop to it. His STOs, his best moonsaults ever when he um you know, he does what he can and he can't cover because his abdomen is too hurt. Right. Even that final last rights, I you know, and then Seidel too with his his leaping DDT um, you know, when he does his, his, he gets a few cradles in quick succession. You know, he does that moonsault to the outside that he usually does, but just the timing of it and the intensity of it was more than I think it normally is. You know, I just, I just really, really like the vibe of the match. And I thought it was a, a very, very good match. You know, like three, I would go probably three and three quarter stars wow. for it. Like I, I, I thought it was a, I just, I don't know. I just, I guess I just like this pairing more than you guys do. Um, but I was, I was impressed with the performance of both guys. Well, I think something we'll all be able to agree on, um, is the next match. Hopefully we'll see. There's going to be a fight. Well, no, honestly, anyone can without do honor. No. Um, this is the Ring of Honor World Title slash Pure Title Pure Wrestling Rules match. Both titles on the line. This was Bill Dissier. Yeah, they're going to unify the belts here. Now, obviously, that didn't happen. We'll explain why. Nigel McGuinness defeats Brian Danielson by countout in 28 minutes 34 seconds. I love this match. I love it for so many reasons. Um, we're told this is the first title versus title match in Ring of Honor history. I, I assume that's true. My memory is always awful. I just have to take their word for it. What's great to me. I'm one pretty of the, sure that's accurate. Yeah. One of the many things that's great to me about this is that it feels like it's a title versus title match in the sense that these two guys, when the way they work this match, it feels like you're seeing the two best wrestlers in the company. Like they they both look very proficient. Like the first half of this match is mostly just technical wrestling, grappling. And it's not even until I think like 10 minutes in that we get a rope break in a pure match. And when we do, Nigel's incredibly pissed off that he even had to use one rope break. Like all the time before that match is these two guys doing everything they can to get out of submissions where they don't even have to use a rope break. Like there's, they're kind of wrestling in a way where it's like, we're so good. We're not even going to have to use the rope break, you know, where it's not even going to be a big struggle. And then eventually it gets to the point where it does become a struggle. And, um, and in a sense, this is a match where that long length actually helps tell that story because they have enough time to kind of, a st- it, it, they give enough time where it's not a problem for them to break holds without using rope breaks that when someone like Nigel finally does use one, it feels like a major victory for Danielson. Then I would say the grappling in this match is just so good. I, I've talked before about there's two kinds of submission wrestling I really like. There's the kind where every move is a struggle and the selling's really great. And then there's like the Zack Saber Jr. type where it's almost like a spot fest in submission form where you see one move, one submission transfers to the next to the next, and you so you never really get bored of it. This I felt like a perfect middle between those two, best of both worlds, where it feels like a struggle, like a real chess match, but they and they but they never. They they, tw- they transition between holds fairly quickly. Like they don't just stay in one hold for a million years usually, and they're really relentless. They never linger too long. So I thought it was a really good middle ground. Then they start ramping up the match halfway through, and then another amazing thing to me about this match was about te- with about ten minutes to go, this match already felt not just better than any match we had seen so far this double shot weekend so far, but more substantial, like more like a complete meal. And they still had at, at like twenty minutes, in, and they still had like ten minutes to go. And then on top of that, this is maybe my favorite part of it is people who have listened to the show know I'm not the hugest guy on pure rules. I don't hate them, but I feel like. Most wrestlers in Ring of Honor, they found like two or three things, the same two or three things you can kind of do with pure rules, and they all hit them. And so I felt like I've seen those notes over and over again in in pure matches. Um, I feel like this match almost single-handedly justified the entire division because it feels like it pays off doing those same tropes over and over again. Like the two biggest near falls in this match – how many matches can you say this about? The two most exciting parts of this match are both count-out teases. You know, the thing people usually groan at. Um, so not, like, and not the, even like a 10 count, but a, a 20 count. Yeah. And um, so the first one is uh, Nigel and brawls with Danielson on the outside. He gets Danielson selling on his back. He then like turns over the timekeeper's table, chokes him with it, runs back in the ring with only seconds to go. And then the, the you watch this match. 
Danielson, you know, gets up and struggles. He gets to the count, you know, in the last second or two. And because Nigel has won so many matches, or at least a few matches this way, with cheap count-out wins, including the match he had with Daniels the night before in Ohio, um, the crowd is actually getting to their feet. You know, they're, they're actually buying that Nigel McGuinness might win this match, title for title they thought it was, from a count out and like it's all because they've just paid it off. They're built, they've built it up with years of pure title matches. And then the second big moment you get Nigel, Brian gets Nigel on the cow mutilation. And that's a big move from Danielson that will get a reaction no matter what, but a lot of wrestlers have survived it. And here it gets a huge reaction because Nigel has used all his rope breaks and he does the thing you've seen in so many pure matches where wrestler uses all his rope breaks. He gets put in a submission he slowly gets the ropes, but when he gets the ropes, he realizes, oh, shit, uh, getting to the ropes won't break it. I've used all my rope breaks, and they really struggle and milk the, this moment. And the crowd, you know, is thinking, oh, shit, you know, we've seen this finish in so many pure matches. But then Nigel eventually keeps crawling to the point where he's under the ropes and he falls out of the ring, and that breaks the hold. And again, that's the thing where that's a, a move, a kind of move you would only see in pure matches and it only has significance because they've teased it. You've seen so many matches end right at that moment and this one doesn't. And then finally at the end, which is the big highlight of the match. Um, half of me loves it. Half of me thinks it's the one flaw of this match where it's another big brawl. Danielson and Nigel are on the outside. They eventually fight into the crowd. Nigel takes this great violent looking bump into the crowd over the guardrail. That seems like the fans didn't have much warning for even Nigel has nope. Danielson has. Oh, go on. Not, no, no warning okay. whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, there were no, there was no students anywhere in the area to like tell me lay back up. So Nothing. Danielson has Nigel hurt. He goes back to the ring to wait out the count to see if Nigel's going to lose from a count out. And with maybe three seconds or so left in the 20 count, Nigel gets back up to his feet and he's in the audience. And Brian does a spot we've seen him do a few times before, which is the springboard, like forward flip dive off the top rope into onto his opponent who's standing in the crowd. It's an awesome spot. But this time, as Danielson's flying through the air, Nigel has grabbed a chair when he got to his feet. He hits Danielson in midair with the chair. No, Danielson's out of it. Nigel gets back in the ring. Danielson can't. Nigel wins the match. So that's an amazing finish in so many ways. It's another great count out tease the fans are buying into. It's an amazing spot from Danielson whenever he does it. And it's a classic twist that we've, that fits the Nigel character, which is it's something really smart, but really cheap and nefarious at the same time. There's two problems with it though. The first is, the only camera angle we have of the spot is from behind Danielson as he flies through the air. So until you hear the commentary say that Nigel hit Danielson with a chair, you would never know that. And in fact, even when I then rewound it and rewatched again, looking for that, you can still only barely kind of realize that, oh, that's what Nigel's doing. The second thing I would say is um, the bigger flaw, which is it's kind of a stupid move on Danielson's part. Like there's the way you watch the match is like, Nigel stands up in the crowd with only seconds left and he's woozy. Like you think maybe he could have just waited it out and won the match there, but instead he decides to take this giant risk and it doesn't pay off. He loses. And part of me thinks, Oh, that's an acceptable choice. Part of me feels like maybe it would have been smart for him just to not to do it. But either way, I thought this was a strong, great match and I'm a hard marker. I'm talking like a strong four and a half stars. I don't, you know, break the five star scale. I think it's one of the better matches we've seen in 2006. Maybe not the best, but I just think this, uh, lived up to the hype. And, uh, Matt, what'd you think about it? Yeah. So it's interesting. Um, the, the way I approach this match, because at this point in the year in ROH, they were building, Three, actually, no, I would say four big singles matches. Um, they were building this match. They were building to a Brian Danielson versus Samoa Joe match. And they were building to Kenta matches, but against Danielson and against Joe. Obviously, the Joe Kenta match never happened, but the other three all did. And I remember in my mindset at the time was, I was really looking forward to Danielson against Joe for the title because I was like, oh man, like I love that Midnight Express reunion match. Now Danielson's even better. That match is going to be epic. I was really looking forward to Joe against Kenta because I just thought they matched up so well. And I remember thinking, 
Well, Brian and Kenta, I don't know what, how well they match up. And I remember thinking, I don't know if Nigel is at the level where he can really hang with these guys and if that's going to be a great matchup. And I mean, obviously I was wrong about all that stuff. Um, and I, this match just, like, I remember just, I wasn't so looking forward to it when it was announced because you know, I didn't, I didn't know if Nigel could be at that level. And I also, Nigel was never presented at that level. He was never presented as anything close to a main eventer. They were building up promos, which I had not seen yet on a lot of those DVDs in Best in the World and, uh, and Super Card of Honor. And, you know, he gave these promos where he was building himself up against Danielson. Um, but I wasn't buying it yet. Um, and then, so when I saw the live report and it was like, oh, this was a must see match. You got to see this. It was an amazing match. I was like, huh. All right. Interesting. And then I finally saw the match and it way exceeded my expectations. I mean, this match is just a complete, like, stone cold classic, legendary match for a lot of reasons. For one, obviously the match itself, but it also kicked off, you know, I'm sure what some would argue would be the greatest singles rivalry in the history of ROH. Uh, one of the greatest rivalries of the 21st century in America, for sure. And with a bang, they kicked it off. I mean, because clearly you see the evolution of these matches, and we'll see them as we go through them. This is not everything they can do, but it's the only time they work a match quite like this, where they don't go to that super emotional place, but they just have this incredible wrestling match where the rivalry is created here. Like this is the genesis of it. It's like the big bang of their rivalry where they, they start out just as two guys who want to prove they're the best. And then by the end, it's just like, Oh, I need to prove that I am better than this person. This person is my arch nemesis and my like mirror image. And I have to be better than them. And you just see that birthed in the middle of the match. Because like I said, Nigel had never been treated at this level before. And Nigel had to do a lot of work to, kind of make himself acceptable at this level. And what you notice is this is, you know, the Nigel's evolved, you know, he's obviously toned down the the wacky British stuff. He's toned down the smarminess. He's toned he doesn't have the the iron anymore that in that he uses in the matches. Right? He's in he's incorporated more impact moves, although he's still not full on all lariats all the time, Nigel, even here. But at this match, he has completely gotten rid of the comedy. There's none of it. There's no more mischief in Nigel's eyes. He is a wrestler that is trying to be the best wrestler. And yes, he still does shady things, and he still knows how to manipulate the pure title rules. But he's doing it in a main eventer way. He's not doing it in a mid-card heel way. And I think that's the part that I find um, so impressive. You know, Danielson was great here. But this was Nigel. This match, the what 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 made this match was Nigel. The fact that he knows how to work the rules. The fact that he's desperate. That he clears off the timekeeper's table. That he starts the brawl in the aisle. And so you mentioned the finish, Trevor. And like so, there were things that I was thinking about the finish. Like, is it cheap to like? Is it WCW ninety six esque to to not announce in advance that only the pure title could change hands? On a count out. And yeah, I guess we should just briefly explain because yeah, we I should mention. So the story of this match is they they really sold this as you know you're going to see the titles unified here, but what happens is and the commentary sells it like early on like you're they make it sound like you're going to see the titles unified here, and then of course at the end of the match Nigel wins by count out. They start to announce that you know Nigel's become the Ring of Honor World Champion, and then referee Todd Sinclair immediately corrects Bobby Cruz and informs everybody that. Because Nigel won by countout, the Ring of Honor pure title can change hands on, on a countout. But since the Ring of Honor regular matches for the world title don't have countouts at all, the world title can't change hands. So Nigel wins the match. He retains his title, but he doesn't win Danielson's title. So, yeah, that's the kind of controversial have your cake and eat it to finish, just for people that were wondering. Yeah, so there was a moment where I was like, oh, that's cheap. And then I decided, you know what? The fact that the crowd wasn't sure made this match so much more dramatic, and that's worth being cheap for, for this one time, to make this a special finish. And like you mentioned, like maybe like it would have been smarter of Danielson not to do that dive. I mean, I think that plays into the story of the match. Nigel worked the smarter match. Nigel was smarter, and he won because he was smarter. Danielson did something dumb, and 
that's good storytelling. Nigel wasn't going to make that dumb mistake. And Nigel took advantage of Danielson's dumb mistake. And that's okay, too. So I think that actually the finish was perfect. And I think the match was perfect. I mean, like, I'm not saying five stars because I do think they topped it. And But, yeah, I could go with your strong four and a half, even four and three quarters. I could see someone yeah. going for this. Like, this was a, just epic Epic match, so well worked, and such a moment for Nigel McGuinness. Like, he never looked back from this moment. So, yeah, phenomenal. Yeah, Jeff, this is one of those matches I'm jealous you got to see live. I mean, this is a – like, Matt really did a good job. Like, this is really the start of something special and something special within itself. So, I have I have so many, like, thoughts on this match that it's really hard to – like put an order to this. So I'm just going to kind of spew all this out and then your listeners can kind of take what they want from it. But the moment that made this match to me in person, as it was happening was during the ring intros, you had the main event intros, Brian, you know, Nigel's announced as the pure champion. Brian goes over, and says to Bobby Cruz during his intro, announced me as the best pure wrestler in Ring of Honor. And I just I looked at all the guys that I was with, you know, all message board people and a couple of friends of mine that lived locally. And I just said, this is going to be fucking unbelievable. I can't wait. And the wrestling within the confines of this match. It's Brian Danielson. It's Nigel McGuinness. It's a rivalry that will stand the test of time forever. Uh, but this is the first time they're they're facing each other. You don't know what to expect, but you also recognize who is in this match and the odds of it not hitting a certain level of expectation uh, are rather impossible. Um, this was as good a wrestling match as... I think the state of Ohio has ever experienced uh, up until uh, July. Uh, so they, they'd have the record for all of about three months. But this was – I it was emotional from the sense of you would see the way Nigel would sell in this match. And he would sell to people in the front row. But it resonated throughout the whole building. Like there was one little kid. And he probably was not so little. He was like maybe a teenager or whatever. Uh, on the right side of the entrance way. And Nigel would look at him. And the hard camera, because it's straight on, it's kind of hard to see this guy. But he he's in that little L uh, as you're coming around the aisle, um, you know, on the entrance side. And Nigel would like sell in that direction and it would just go in all the ways around ringside. Um, obviously, you know, the finish, in my opinion, I think is a stroke of genius because, OK, I could see one way of looking at it and saying it's a it's a cop out. But at the other time, I'm thinking to myself, like there wasn't one person, myself included in this building that thought, holy shit, they just put the belt on Nigel. I'll be goddamned, and it's the second to last match on the show. We still have one more to go. Uh, for 28 minutes and 35 seconds, these two guys could do no wrong. It it like it was hard not rooting for Brian Danielson. It was equally hard not rooting for Nigel McGuinness. Uh, like there's so many things. Nigel's aggression ramping up throughout the match. And, like, you just see him transform into this main eventer right before your eyes. And I'm thinking, like, on the way home, I remember saying in the car, like, I saw Nigel McGuinness wrestle surfer Cody Hawk in front of 27 people in, in an opening match and sat next to this guy in a seminar taught by Dusty Rhodes in September of 2002. Now he's wrestling for the Ring of Honor World Championship against undisputedly the best wrestler in the world to present day. I think in 2006, Brian was the best wrestler on planet Earth. 
here we are all these years later. I think the argument can still be made. He never let go of that crown, uh, except for when he was out. Uh, and the idea of the, the chair and Nigel using nefarious tactics, uh, making him a, a bad guy in theory, but yet Brian is still doing, I'm the cocky prick that you love world champion character, man. Like I, it's just, it, it's the fastest half hour match. I think I have ever been to. Um, I thought Todd Sinclair did an incredible job officiating the match and not getting in the way being in the right spot at the right time. You know, timing his pinfalls properly um, so that, you know, the kickouts were right as the hand was just about to hit. Um, i would never seen anything like this in the state of Ohio before. And to know that this is happening, you know, 56 minutes from my front door, uh, it's it's a revelation. It's. It still gives me goosebumps to this day. And when I watched it back uh, at like three o'clock this morning, because I told you guys I was going to watch the show last (laughs) night and Cavs tickets fell into my lap. But uh, when I watched it back this morning, it was just like, how, how does this match just hold up so brilliantly? And then they managed to do it like another seven times with each other over the course of the next uh, three years. And every match was different. Every match was just as good, um, if not better. And the the birth of their rivalry, this is the kind of reason why I would, you know, I fell in love with Ring of Honor. It's it's why this is my wrestling. You know, the, the people that grew up in the 80s and were children of the 80s, You know, they had their Hulk Hogan and that's their wrestling or they had, you know, Flair and Sting and that's their wrestling. This is this is booked and built for me. And I got to credit one last person in this before I, I, uh, you know, put a a, a bow on my rant and rave here. Uh, Actually, I'm going to credit two people. One, Bobby Cruz, who did a great job selling the idea of a new world champion, which is very much an important job of a ring announcer to sell the announcement and Gabe for helping flesh out that finish, because I don't think anybody would have reacted positively in this manner to a count out for a ring of honor world title match during the run of Loki, during the run of Xavier, during the run of Samoa Joe during the run of Austin Aries, during the run of CM Punk, during the run of James Gibson. And lo and behold, Brian Danielson is world champion. Nigel McGuinness is the pure champion. And they find a way to do a 20 count count out finish in a world title match that keeps the belts where they're supposed to be and get a magnanimous reaction from this audience. Yeah, I would say it's that's one the gorgeous. biggest magic. Fucking ma- gorgeous. One of the biggest magic tricks this match pulls off is not only getting fans excited for countouts, but then giving a ma- a, a finish that in a way is kind of a, a cheap finish and a finish that do- it's almost like a dusty finish where you think you're getting a big momentous thing and then it turns out everyone just keeps their title and yet it's so it's inventive enough and it fits the characters well enough that like and ROH never did it before and when you don't do something too much then it works. Yeah, exactly. Yep. And, it, it, you know, it all pays off in this match. So much build. The other interesting thing about this match is uh, going to the Observer, Dave Meltzer would write at the time, in what two people report as a four-star match and said to be the best match of the weekend, the title versus title Ooh. match with Daniels. <laughs> yeah, two low four stars. But the title versus title match with Daniels and versus McGinnis ended with neither belt changing hands, but McGinnis getting his hand raised. Said to be McGinnis's best match since coming to Ring of Honor. You're probably noticing a pattern here where everyone's best match being be, is their challenges to Danielson. Originally, this was planned to be a one-time belt versus belt deal because there was no plans to change the titles, but the match was so good, it appears they will turn this into a program. So yeah, that was the story. I mean, 
I don't see why people would have a reason to lie to Dave about that. That the idea was this was supposed to be just like a special one-off match, and it was so good you get the entire program because of that. That they decide we got to run with this, which of course leads to a million matches and the titles outright actually being unified this year. But um, yeah, so and, yeah, and I, it's just hard to believe they'd come back three months later in the same building and find a way to top this. Yeah, um, like I know you guys didn't want to go the full five stars, but. I mean, from a live perspective, I probably would have given this five, uh, you know, watching it back at, at you know, three thirty this morning or whatever it was. Uh, I probably still gave it the same uh, emphatic five stars. But, um, man, like it, there's just there's magic with these two. And, the you know, as the police said, every time, every time they touch, um <laughs> This this is this is magic. These two guys. One, one thing I will say, as much as I love the book, I do love the end in the sense that it gives everyone something to go away with. Like Nigel can say, "I honestly beat you." To what Matt's point, he can say, "I outsmarted you," you know, and I won, so I'm the best wrestler in the world now. My title is the most important. And Danielson can equally say, "Hey, I still have my title, and you hit me with a chair." You're so I. So I love that. But the one part of the booking that I think is dumb, and we've seen this occasionally in Ring of Honor, and it's more just a match thing, and it's kind of hard, which is there are two ways there, – there, there are two booking logics, right? There's the booking logic of this makes sense if you were going to book a card for real, and then there's the – this makes sense in terms of how you structure a card to optimize fan enjoyment. So in kayfabe – there is no logical reason to put a title versus title unification match second from the top. Like that should be the guaranteed main event of any card it's booked on, but it only makes sense from the other point of view, which is Gabe knew the finish of this match. He knew it'd be a controversial heel win finish. And so typical Booker logic is you want the fans to go home happy. You know, the tag title match is going to end with the faces winning clean. So, you, th- but that's the only way this makes sense. Like I realized this was a point in Ring of Honor history where they were trying to have the tag titles main event more. In, and fact, them in, seem- fact, in fact, Trevor, did you realize that with this show, the third tag title main event of 2006, that in 2006 at this point, the tag titles have now main evented an equal number of shows as the world title. Yeah, that's that's yeah. wild, but it, it 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 is this this one show where it's like this really looks kind of dumb that this was the semi main event. I mean, but but again, from a booking logic, it makes sense from a booking standpoint. But well, so one of the other things that they did at the end with the five more minutes thing, um, and Nigel declining during that little stare down where brian is telling nigel don't leave yet don't leave yet don't leave yet if you can read his lips uh and he's like turning around and pointing at the crowd to and you know get them to chant for five more minutes i'm sitting there thinking oh my god shelly and raver winning the tag titles and prince not is not here to enjoy it (laughs) yeah you're gonna get something so, yeah, after the match, we get a bunch of different scattered chants from a crowd that seems kind of mixed on how to feel. There's a, like a brief bullshit chant from some fans, but then there are other fans that are just chanting for Danielson and are so relieved that he he kept the title. So it, it, it's not like even a universal kind of bad reaction at any point. Um, Brian eventually gets back to the ring. He shouts for the five more minutes. Big crowd pop. Crowd chants for it. Nigel has the ref raise his arm and leaves the ring. Crowd ends up getting Danielson a standing ovation. And so that brings us to the main event. We get a highlight package building up the Generation Next Embassy feud history. And then we get the Ring of Honor tag team title match. Generation Next of Austin Aries and Roderick Strong successfully defend the titles when they defeat the Embassy of Alex Shelley and Jimmy Rave, scored to the ring by Daisy Hayes, in 18 minutes, 9 seconds, when Aries pinned uh, Rave after hitting a 450 splash. Matt, um... This is a like it's a hell of a hard act to follow where two of the last three matches were like Super Dragon getting murdered and then the, one of the better matches we've seen of the year. How do you think these guys did in the the kind of really big ask to follow that? Yeah, it was impossible to follow it. Like they have a good match because they're good wrestlers. They certainly don't have the best match that these four could have. Um, you know, in fact, like you know that. I wouldn't say like the work in the early part of the match is pedestrian because it's like 
obviously the embassy are a fun heel team and they do a lot of fun heel stuff. And obviously Aries and Strong are great, you know, charis well at this point, especially Aries, charismatic baby faces. But you could tell that something was missing. You know, they Shelly and Rave, they do their little hugs and their butt slaps and they're kind of gay baiting stuff. And I sometimes wonder, like, I wonder what, like, I remember we asked, like, what moment in wrestling they don't do as much, like, misogyny stuff. I wonder what moment in wrestling the tag team stopped doing gay baiting because you really don't see that much now. And, like, there had to have been a moment, and I don't know when it was. Um, but like, I, I did like, you know, some stuff in the early part of the match, like, like they're brawling on the floor. And at one point, um, uh, like, you know, so I like that they start with double dives very early where Aries hits the heat seeking missile and strong hits a plancha. And then at one point they can, they brawl on the floor and a fan says, I'm not sure what it's in reference to, but they say, a fan says his testicles don't deserve that. And, you know, it just kind of made me wonder what his testicles deserve. Um, <laughs> and then, and what's funny is. Later on in the match, um, there's a point where Daisy Hayes comes in and low blows Aries, and then Shelly just squeezes Aries in the crotch. And I was thinking, you know, his testicles do not deserve that. So that fan <laughs> was right. Cause, and then later on, they – or like right after that, the embassy take over on Aries, and they hang Aries up in the tree of woe, and Shelly stands on his groin. And I'm just like, his testicles don't deserve that. So I think that's my my mantra for this match is his testicles don't deserve that. Um, but as far as the match goes, you know, like they, they do work on Aries' neck, so there is a bit of – Storyline. There was even a fun spot where um, Shelly does Aries trademark fish hook on him. He does a camel clutch, and there's actually a weird spot with the camel clutch because so Shelly has Aries in the camel clutch, and there's a spot where the ref is distracted, and Daisy Hayes comes off the top rope and drop kicks Aries, and I think what she was supposed to do was drop kick Aries in the face while Shelly was pulling back on the camel clutch, but it looked like she overshot and like kind of went over Shelly. So Shelly like lets go, I guess, to move out of the way. And Hayes does drop kick Aries like she's supposed to, but then because Shelly moved out of the way, she falls and lands right on the back of Shelly's head. And that looked pretty painful for Shelly. He was grabbing his head. I was worried about him, but he seemed okay afterwards. But then at that point, Strong gets the hot tag, and then things really pick up. They do their, you know, Generation X hits the double team backbreaker on Rave, chop brainbuster combo on Rave. Shelly breaks that up. Shelly keeps escaping the half Nelson backbreaker, hits a super kick and air raid crash on Roderick. Embassy hits the clothesline spear combination. Rave follows that up with the running knee, gets a near fall. Aries goes for a roaring forearm on Rave, but Shelly pops in and interrupts with a super kick. And then Rave hits the gonorrhea, gets a two count on that. Shelly goes for a slice spread number two on Strong, but Strong catches him and hits him with like this crazy tombstone variant. Um, then Rave is about to hit greetings from Ghana on Aries, but Strong hits him with a sick kick. Um, Strong goes for the half Nelson uh, backbreaker on Rave. Aries goes up top, but Hayes tries to stop Aries, and Shelly does. They both get knocked down. Strong hits two half Nelson backbreakers on Rave, and Aries hits the 450, gets the win. So the match ended up being good, and I thought the ending sequence was a fun sprint, but you know the crowd was tired. Uh, I think I was tired. There, uh, there was something kind of generic about the middle compared to what maybe we usually see from these guys. And, you know, these four are also talented, so it was still good, but it just, it didn't feel like they were letting it all hang out. It felt like they were saving something for a rematch that never happened. So this match, I, to me, ended up just being good. Kind of a disappointing main event after everything we saw. Uh, Jeff, what did you think? But also, I just want to say, I feel like, again, this is a match you got lucky to see because I feel like irregardless of the quality of the match itself, I feel like Rave and Shelly were such a great comedic act at this point. And I feel like I feel like there were so many things where you could tell that they were interacting with the crowd and talking to them and little asides and things they were saying on the apron that, you know, some of them they pick up on the DVD, but a lot you can't. And I feel like. The, these were one of the guys where I was like, man, I wish I could watch more of their matches like live because I feel like that would have been so much fun. You There would have been so many little jokes and interactions you would have gotten that you just don't get on a DVD. Yeah, that's that's the, the charm of the Shelly and Rave tag team is that they are the kings of the little things. Um, mannerisms and you know, just smirks on their faces. Like, 
uh, you know, I, I specifically like going into this show and I, I'm looking at my notes from when we did the pod and I wrote down that I spent roughly $200 on toilet paper. Jesus that Christ. toilet paper shower was like five minutes. And so they, they do the big, huge toilet paper shower. And I, there were other people that brought toilet paper, so I don't want to take all the credit for it. But I wanted it to, to be like the biggest one of all time. And I had forewarned Jimmy that I was going to be doing that. So, you know, like Shelly gets hit in the head with um, toilet paper. He takes a bump. Uh, Daisy you know, tries to catch a flying piece of a flying roll of toilet paper. It goes right through her hands and she just kind of looks disappointed in herself, like a receiver that doesn't catch a pass. Um, you know, Jimmy's used to, you know, launching toilet paper back at people, uh, you know, as soon as it comes in the ring. So he's doing that and he's talking to them. And at one point he gets on the apron and he just kind of looked over at me and, and just kind of winked. Like that's the real reason. This was, this is the real reason this was the main event because you had told them about your toilet paper shower, and they knew no match could follow that epic <laughs> toilet paper shower. I mean, Brian and Nigel probably could have followed this, and it would have been just fine. But um, then there was the the like false flag toilet paper throw that Shelly and Ray both sold uh, before the match started. Like somebody threw like a, a bundled up napkin that didn't make it past the front row, but you can see it in the air on the hard cam. And Shelly was like, Whew, Oh my God. Like, and that, that, that was coming right for me. And uh, it's like, you know, all the antics that those two had together, the, the, gay baiting and and that kind of stuff like it fit for them but does it exist in 2022 if we're running that back no um but it worked for for the reaction that they wanted back then um the idea that this match got a video package was surprising um but i guess we're trying to convince the people that aries and strong are you know as equal main eventers as Brian Danielson. Um, that's fine, I guess. Uh, it also felt to me just the that they were was, maybe like, oh, we have a lot of footage of these guys against each other. Like, we yes. could use, we, we could make this easy, you know? We, we will copy and paste like three different files into one and yeah. they will <laughs> give us a proper yeah. order. But yeah. like, the, the idea that these guys are uh, Aries and Strong, that is, like, having this great tag title run and they haven't even like really hit their stride yet. And the rave Shelley team is main eventing against them. They didn't do a title change. The title for title match was before this. I'm thinking like the whole time I'm waiting for the finish of a title change. I literally, I bit on every finish in this match. Cause I was just so convinced they were switching the belts. Um, and and they were going to go into a, a extended series where they traded the titles back and forth or whatever. Because I think the, the long-term play was to get to the Briscoes, uh, which Shelly and Ray versus the Briscoes sounds pretty good to me. Um, just saying. Uh, I love the, the, the wrestling inside of this match. Uh, I think Shelly and Aries have a really underrated uh, chemistry against each other. And I think Alex Shelley is actually Austin Aries' best opponent. Uh, if you look at quality over quantity. Uh, and I think Roddy is really at a point where he's starting to grow. Like he's coming off the Danielson series and now he's got the tag titles. He's on top. Uh, this is a different version of Roderick than the guy that we saw a year ago at this time. And Again, that progression as a wrestler getting better and better every match, that's what I look for when I'm watching. And clearly, Roddy uh, got so good over you know a, a very short period of time. Uh, I do love the finish. 
Shelly uh, goes to a sliced bread uh, in, in, is at the start of the finish. It's something I really, really liked. Uh, strong counters with the Rikishi driver. Uh, it was also the greetings from Asbury Park. Uh, greetings from the 216 if you watch yeah. the Shane Taylor match. Um, a lot of people use that that variation, uh, the sit-out tombstone. Um, then Roddy hits a sit kick, which... I think that was this is kind of the frame of his career where that's becoming the signature move uh, with the name attached to it. Rave takes this great bump. Uh, then the full Nelson backbreakers. Aries sends Shelly away. And then you get the beautiful 450 splash from Aries for the win, uh, pinning Jimmy Rave. Uh, it's it. The match is as good as I remember live. Um, but the thing that I take away from this was. A, I still thought this should have been a title change. And B, Shelly and Rave are so good together, they'll never get the credit they deserve uh, as a tag team. Uh, I I really wish we could have seen like a series of these matches. I, gu- I guess the reason why they couldn't put the titles on the embassy is because Shelly was only going to have one more ROH match in 2006, and then he was gone as Correct. a regular. Yeah, I don't have much yep. more to add about the the match. I I, I agree. I, I think especially with Matt, like I would give this like a three and a half stars. But like there was something a little bit, yeah. You felt like they could have better match. It felt a, almost a little more low stakes than a main event for the tag title should. I mean, there was a fair bit of comedy in at some points, although they did you know get serious. But I did like you know the stuff like the baseball gimmick where they had Aries and Strong you know, acted like you're playing a baseball game and they go around and touch the corners like bases and then do a baseball slide drop kick in the corner and say, you know, you're safe and all that. Like, I like goofy stuff like that. But overall, yeah, th- th- this is another match I would say that fe- this felt like the-, the Joe versus Claudio match felt like a bad house show match. This felt like a, a good house show match. Like, yeah, you- you'd see better on a bigger show, but like you're you're decently satisfied with what you got here. They, they-, they didn't. Ha- completely half acid or anything. It, it was fun enough. It's, but, it's yeah. actually, when you mention the comedy, it's an interesting point because that's the stuff that Nigel shed on this show to say, all right, I'm going to yep. make this a real serious main event. And the tag title match, they decided to go in the other direction. They were like, okay, we're going to keep it because that's, that's a good part of our stick. And it doesn't matter if our main event seems as epic as it otherwise might. But yeah, and it, it, it's tough because as good as, um, Rave and Shelly were as wrestlers. I felt like the special thing that they were really developing together that I'm going to miss so much is just how good they were at comedy. And, and like Jeff said, how good they were at like being spontaneous and finding little moments, reacting to things organically in the matches and from the crowd. Like I felt like they were doing that better than pretty much probably anyone else in the company. So it's almost like if you told them just to be serious, in some ways that is conducive to like better matches, but then you're kind of taking away like one of the unique things that makes them kind of special together is they have this great chemistry with comedy and with being the kind of heels that show ass and get humiliated and like get mad at the crowd and and be kind of buffoons a little bit. Like that's their, I'm going to miss that. They're so good at that, you know, and you know, one was about to go. They knew how to, they knew how to time the comedy so well. And I, I think that's something Alex Shelley still does to this day. Yeah, uh, in his matches, like he knows how to pick his spots, but this match felt like they had taken the formula from the Joe J Lethal match at Dissension and just copy and pasted it with Aries and Strong. Yeah, and I think it's a formula that worked so well for Jimmy and Alex as a tag team, and this is something you know we talked to Jimmy with, uh, you know his. He played off because none of none of the comedy stuff was really his lead. It was yeah. him having this innate ability to read his partner. Uh, doing it with, with Shelly, he did it with Sal Renaro, and it worked for them. Um, I I just think it's such a shame that there was not more of the Shelly and Rave, you know, duo because. The I could just think of the ridiculous promos that with the cheap yeah. props that Ring of Honor would provide. You know, maybe they're like 
they're they're standing right in front of the helicopter in the Dayton building with the tag belts and <laughs> yeah. you know one of the whoever Nana's flunky at the time was uh you know is holding one of the belts and it like flows away and it's just being pulled on a string you know uh it's silly shit like there's so much silly stuff they could have done and mixed in there and it, you know one more match for Shelly in 2006 and off to the land of the impact zone he goes so uh yeah we have one segment left we return backstage where dave prezak is with nigel mcginnis he asks nigel if he feels he's proven that he's the best champion in the company nigel thinks that he has but then brian danielson interrupts he asks nigel if he's such a great pure wrestler why do you need a chair to beat the best wrestler in the world and then at this point delirious just wanders in he starts jabbering at danielson in delirious speak we're holding his torn mask that i guess uh danielson had torn in their match at the hundredth show and then while brian is distracted just wondering what the hell's going on with delirious nigel hits danielson in the back with his pure title delirious immediately just runs away nigel stands over danielson and he says that's the kind of champion i am you're lying on the floor i beat you tonight i don't need anyone else to tell me what i did you know and you know that's the start of the feud so if if gabe really did think that uh if, if that story is true that dave got from the observer that um they didn't they planned this as a one-off and then changed their mind and made it a series. Well, they changed their mind basically immediately after that match. It probably wouldn't be the first time David, you know, changed booking based on how well a match had gone on. I know that's true. But, like, because well, clearly so this, here, this, you don't film this not knowing that you're going back to this match. So here, here's a thought that I pondered when you said that this was planned as a one-off uh, or when Dave wrote that. You repeated it. It's that. You're, you know, by this point, you're going to England in August. Yeah. You, you mean to tell me you're not doing another Nigel and Brian match in England? Yeah. If you, if you're booking what uh, other match is acceptable, you're immediately thinking, what's a big match I could put Nigel in? Yeah. Yeah. There's no bigger match. Yeah. It is interesting to think like if they, if this did turn out to be a one-off, what does Nigel do in England? Like, do they just do like a big pure title defense? Does the pure title stick around? Like, you know, it's an interesting, if, if this really was originally supposed to be one match and done, that's a big, interesting one. Cause Danielson's career, you know, he loses a key feud, but it probably stays pretty similar. Nigel's career, who knows, you know, I mean, he'd still do well, but this is a big thing for him. It changes his division, changes everything. But either way, um, that is Weekend of Champions Night 2. Um, Jeff, you will not uh, – you know, you we had just watched the first half of this double shot previously. I can just say clearly with this fresh in our minds, Matt, I think you'd agree – this easily blows away the first show of the double shot, which we said was one oh, of the yeah. weaker, weaker Ring of Honor shows we had seen in a while. Um, you know, this is not. I, a per- you know what? It, it's funny. I I remember during the day uh, driving up to Cleveland from from my house and just thinking like the most perfect ROH World Title match for that Dayton show was. Brian and Jimmy Yang. <laughs> you couldn't have found a more appropriate mid world title match to to slot into that show and then just get us to Saturday. And I was like, if this show is not as good as yesterday, then we're in really big trouble. Because <laughs> I was at both. Uh, if, if Dayton and Cleveland were back to back, I was always in in both. And um, man, that that Dayton show. Whew. Yeah, I mean, this show is not without flaws. I think we've talked about, you know, stuff like Joe Claudio is disappointing. You know, there's some matches that maybe don't quite overachieve, but I think there was enough good stuff here to make this a pretty good show. And especially, I mean, the rest of the show could be complete garbage. To me, Nigel and Daniels was at the level of that's a go out of your way to see it, even if the rest of the of the show is like two and a half hours of a monkey masturbating or something like you still would buy the show and just fast forward or, or not fast forward depends what you're into. And, um, but then you also got to see the, you know, the blow off of the Whitmer BJ thing. And, and I thought that was suitably big and felt like a major event type thing. And there was some other, you're ending the show talking about masturbating and BJ. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Matt, my question to you is, do you think this show would be improved if it was just Danielson and uh, Nigel and then a bunch of a video of animals masturbating. 
we got we got a BJ. So I mean, um, <laughs> no, but no, but ser- seriously, on this show, um, you know, the, obviously, the, I don't think this was the best show of the year or anything like that. But like, I do think it was better than a couple of the milestone series shows, and like, it's a legitimately great show because of how great the good stuff is, and. You know, I think it's it's an underrated gem of a show, and I think um, you know, like even like with some of the down stuff, like this was a very entertaining show from pretty much start to finish, and um, I liked the Daniels and Seidel match more than the two of you did. So I think yeah. overall, I would give this True. show a v- extremely big thumbs up, and I was very impressed at how well it held up rewatching it. Like just a really good show, and. By the way, like, I, I mean, so much better than the other two Cleveland shows. I'm sure you'll agree, Jeff. Like, this is actually, yes. I would say, the only Cleveland show so far where it's like they gave you a full on A show. And I, you know, and I, I, I hope that there's more of them. But this was a, this was just a, a real, this show made me very happy, I guess is what I'll say. This is one of the best shows I think the state of Ohio ever got uh, from Ring of Honor. And it's really odd that, like, the rivalry between Nigel and Brian started in Cleveland. Yeah. And it's something that is – it's generally viewed as, like, a New York-style match. Well, that's the thing. Uh, You said earlier, like, this match is legendary. And, like, I feel like when we rewatch it, it's legendary. It deserves to be legendary. But I feel like when people think of the feud, they think of, obviously, the UK match with good reason. They think mm -hmm. of, like, the last match they had because that was, like, a dual farewell for them. Maybe they think of the fact they had a 60-minute match, even though that's not their best match. But, like, they don't – The best uh, one was the sixth anniversary. Yeah, yeah like, that was, and that was too. like the fourth or fifth one in yeah. the series. I, th- yeah, I, th- I, th- I think this match is more famous than the 60 minute one. I will say that. But you're right about the other ones. It, it, it does yeah. not. It, it deserves to be in that pantheon. And maybe it doesn't get mentioned quite as much because it's in the middle. It's it's just shoved into like a double shot after this big milestone series of big shows. And it's like the first two shows that were kind of smaller st- shows afterwards i feel like people kind of sleep on this a little bit more than they should when this match like it's worth going out of your way to see i agree this was the end of the most consecutive roh shows i had attended in a row How many was uh, that? up until this point so it started with arena warfare wow and then went to this. Oh man, uh, so, yeah, that's quite a few. So what would that would have been? Uh, eight, I think. Eight, seven. Yeah, so so eight. Arena, arena warfare, best in the world. Dragon Gate Challenge, Super Card of Honor, better than our best. Hundredth show, uh, Champions Night One, Champions Night Two. That's eight. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. That's a hell of a run. But uh, Jeff, yeah, if you want to hear like about, to... oh, go on. I'd like to thank Jimmy Yang for main eventing the second to last <laughs> night of this this series of shows. Um, it was it was a it was a Ring of Honor title match. But uh, yeah, so you know, if you want to hear more about some of those shows, I mean, you know, I know you've done them with Shane Hagedorn on your own show, an honorable mention. But so everyone should check that show out. We plug that a lot. But Jeff, do you have anything else you want to plug? Now's the time. Like social media, any other projects, anything you want. So I have a couple of social media things to plug and uh, I'm going to pull up my Twitter just so I can, and I still have Twitter for now. Um, I'm on Hive. Uh, that's the, the new, new place. You can find me on there at Jeff Schwartz and S C H W A R T Z is how you spell Schwartz. Um, so I'm just at Jeff Schwartz on Hive. Um, my Twitter is at, uh, Mr. Jeff Schwartz Zero. And of course, um, we've got uh, at an honorable pod on Twitter. Uh, podcast currently in hiatus because Hagedorn is writing Code of Honor, which will be recapping 20 years of ROH, which is just an insane number yeah. to even think about. And we'll be at 21 years by the time this book is probably halfway written just from what I've seen so far. It's great though. I I can't implore anybody 
anymore to uh, to go out and buy that book when it comes out. Um, it's it is a labor of love, and Hagedorn is working his ass off on it. So follow that at Code of Honor book on Twitter. And uh, I have a little project that is coming along uh, very slowly that my friend Jacob Cohen uh, and I are, are potentially going to be starting at some point in the next month. And uh, if you follow along on Twitter, at Coliseum Vid Pod. So at Coliseum Vid Pod, we're going to watch all the Coliseum home videos uh, in order. Uh, we both have Blu-ray sets, and we'll probably just do it in watch-along format and have a lot of laughs and, you know, make ourselves giggle and <laughs> have some good Jewish humor um, <laughs> that we'll, we'll mix in. We'll see who our mensch of the show is and, uh, you know, maybe uh, – you know, we've got these all these Coliseum Home videos in their original format, so they're not network format. Um, they're going to be available to you to watch along with us. So it'll be back like when Bruce and Conrad's podcast was good. And uh, that's it. Um, but, yeah, most importantly, just stay tuned to my Twitter or Hive, uh, and you'll get the latest and greatest uh, as to what we're going to do. Um, I'm hoping to get the first episode. It's not going to be a weekly with Jacob and I. He's got a child. And uh, one of the other reasons for an honorable mention being on pause uh, is because I'm working uh, 90 to 100 hour weeks wow. uh, on average. So uh, I, I've got a, a really nice client that uh, has paid me to uh, clean up their car database and i'd like to get it done as soon as possible so i can <laughs> do it again um at the start of 2023 so uh the coliseum video pod is going to be like a once maybe twice a month if we get a chance and um i'm really looking forward to it because some of that stuff it ages so poorly and it is to be laughed at and laughed at justifiably <laughs> well if you want to get in touch with us it's um at Trevor Dame on Twitter, at Mayor MGF on Twitter. I guess we should set up other social media just in case, but I've been a little slack on that. Um, until then, uh, we got our through the years at gmail.com. That's T H R O H for through if you want to get in touch with us more personally. And next time on the show, we will be covering how we rolled the, the night Christian Cage. King to Ring of Honor. It didn't maybe the memory is that it didn't turn out that well. We'll we'll reevaluate, and I'm sure lots of other stuff happened. But that's that for now. So until next time, have a good time. Have a great time. <laughs>